Live from our Lakeview studio in the Windy City, welcome to Chicago Python Data Special Interest Group. My name is Ali Sivji. I'm one of the organizers of Chicago Python. I'm going to be your host for tonight's events. All right, so before we do get started, I want to make everybody aware of our code of conduct. Anytime you're interacting in a chippy space, uh, just make sure that you're uh, treating people with respect and uh, following the rules of our code of conduct. All right, let me find my, can't find my speaker notes. Let me get those back up. All right, cool. All right. Cool, so what is Chicago Python? Chicago Python, or the Chicago Python Users Group, or Chippy, what have you, is a Python-focused user group that was started back in 2003. Uh, we've grown from our humble beginnings of meeting in the back of a bar or in small conference rooms to become one of the largest Python user groups in the world. We have around 6,000 members. And every month, we usually hold four to six events. Uh, our main or our headline events are the Dunder main meeting. Uh, that happens on the second Thursday of every month. And we also have a monthly project night, and that's on the third Thursday of every month. We also have a lot of events that focus in on more of a niche application of Python. We have this event, which is the data SIG. We have the web dev slash DevOps SIG. There's a special interest group for algorithms and uh, data structures. And we also have one focused in on finance. Do want to make everybody aware of our upcoming events. On July 2nd, we have our algorithm special interest group. On July 9th, we're going to have our next main meeting or next Dunder main meeting. On July 15th, it's going to be our next data SIG. And then August 4th, we're going to have our next web dev slash DevOps SIG. We did actually just uh, get our speakers confirmed for next month's data SIG. So I'm really excited to announce uh, it's going to be Chippy Data Special Interest Group presents time series analysis. We have three fantastic talks. The first one's going to be uh, by Anahis Dotis Georgiou about Facebook profit and time series databases, specifically InfluxDB. Uh, the next talk is going to be by uh, Chippy community member Ray Burr. He's going to be talking about using Facebook profit in production. And then finally, we have a talk about a new uh, time series analysis library called Stumpy. And we have Sean Law, who is the core maintainer and I believe the creator of this library. He's going to come on and give an hour long deep dive. Uh, looking forward to that. Uh, what else is going on? We've been taking a little bit of a break from our mentorship program to re, uh, refocus our energies and release a new version of this program. Uh, so it's going to be called the Buddy Mentorship Program. I believe more details are going to be announced in uh, July, so stay tuned for that. Uh, Chippy is one of the community sponsors of the Python Web Conference. That's happening. Uh, it started today. There was a day of tutorials, and it's going to be happening tomorrow and on Friday. There's uh, two days of talks. I uh, really, uh, really suggest you all go check it out. There seems to be a lot of great talks uh, scheduled. Uh, what else is going on in the world? Today is also the last day you can vote in the PSF elections for the Board of Directors. Uh, if you're a voting member, you should have got an email. Uh, we're actually going to be talking about this a little, little, a little later in this live stream, so uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, where can you find us? We have a very active Slack community. It's at uh, joinchippy.slack.herokuapp.com. Uh, go on that website, send yourself an invite, join our community of around 2,000 folks talking about Python. The happenings happening uh, in Chicago as well as uh, the wider ecosystem as a whole. We're also on the Twitters. Uh, find out what's going on on our Twitter at Chicago Python. And all this information plus a lot more is on our website and that's at chippy.org. Uh, we have two fantastic talks lined up tonight. 
The first talk is going to be by Ryan Bales about gathering insights from audio data. And the next talk is going to be by Lorena Mesa on uh, deep learning telenovela in Python. So looking forward to that. Uh, if you look to your, uh, my right, there's going to be a little box with a live chat. If you do have questions for our speakers, please put them in the live chat. We do have a discussion question for today. So what is your favorite Python uh, workflow orchestration tool? Is it Prefix? Is it Azkaban? That's what I use at work. Is it Apache Airflow? Or is it like something like Luigi? Or maybe you're going old school and you're using GNU Make. Tell me what you're using. I'm really excited to learn about that. All right, so that's enough about me. Let me uh, get Ryan Bills on our live stream. Hey, Ryan, welcome Hi, to Lee. Chippy. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being on. I, I know we've been trying to get you for a while. We had that event scheduled back in March, but uh, we're excited to have you. Awesome, uh, awesome, happy to be here. Can you please introduce yourself to our audience? Sure, so my name is Ryan Bales. Uh, I'm the Director of Data Science and Analytics at Dialog Tech. We are a um, uh, marketing analytics company focusing on inbound um, phone calls for, um, for marketers in the um, different uh, spaces. We look, work a lot with companies in um, uh, MarTech and uh, uh, healthcare and other things like that, helping them get a large understanding of the things that are going on in their phone calls, what sources are driving those calls. And, and my team, our data science analytics team is responsible for uh, building, training, deploying, and managing all of our models and analytics software that we use to gather insights from those calls, from the call recording and transcription and other, other pieces of data. Awesome, so is most of the work you do in Python? Yes, it is, just about 99% of it. We get a little bit of Java and uh, some other things in there. For my team, Dialog Tech has a lot of other stuff going on. We have a lot of uh, PHP for our web front ends, um, yeah. some Node.js, React, things like that going on. Um, and a awesome. little bit of Ruby in there for funsies too. Yeah, I mean, you gotta have it all, right? Wouldn't be a stack <laughs> without Ruby. <laughs> exactly. So how did you uh, first get into Python? Well, it's, it's interesting. So um, I've uh, started out of college working in the .NET space. I was on the on the dark side with Microsoft and everybody else and um, all, of, all of those companies in the, in the .NET world. And I had a good friend of mine, his name was Tim, who was working at Dialog Tech. And I was talking to him one day over lunch about making a change and, and looking at more open source technologies. And he was like, hey, we need someone to come help lead a team over here. Why don't you come give it a give it a whirl? I'm like, well, I don't know a lot of PHP. I haven't done a lot with it. He's like, oh, well, you'll, you'll figure it out. Uh, he believed in me a lot. And I came over and um, started leading a team, starting focusing on on analytics-based web apps, and um, and that's now grown into lots of other other Python and other work at the company. So it's been it's been a great actually five years this month actually at Dialog Tech. So awesome. So what would you say has been like the best uh, like the most uh, the, the achievement you're proudest of at Dialog Tech? So um, I came into Dialog Tech during an acquisition um, where two companies in the same space were, were merging. They, they had purchased a company. Um, I was not at that company, but I kind of joined during that whole process and. Um, my team took on a lot of work to take a um, their analytics platform and, and migrate it into the, the Dialog Tech core platform. So there was a lot of web-based engineering, a lot of API work, a lot of data structures, figuring out how you store these large systems and um, kind of reinventing our transcription environment and improving it as well. Um, we were getting a lot of feedback about poor transcription quality and things like that. So we went out to the market, did a lot of analysis on different vendors, and, and we have from that, we have built what we call at Dialog Tech the Analytics Processing Pipeline. It's a it's all AWS based, um, all all cloud um, virtualized, and it's it's a combination of different lambdas and queues and streams and EC2 groups that we run uh, millions of minutes of phone calls through per month, and it it uh, it runs like a champ. So we're really really proud of it. That sounds awesome. But uh, just so a lot of our community members are right now dealing with uh, being isolated and uh, still having to deal with some of the sheltering in place. Would you mind sharing yeah. a little bit about your experience and how you have dealt with it? Yeah, so it's been it's been very interesting for me. I um, I was actually so I'm talking to all of you from about 500 miles away right now in, in lovely Cleveland, Ohio. I live on the uh, eastern side of the city, and uh, but I I've been in Dallas like five years, and I've been coming to Chicago for five years now, just about once or twice a month. So I, I know a lot of uh, areas of the city very well, but um, I was traveling so much this year. And then like, as of like March or whatever it was, it just stopped. And um, I, I kind of miss Chicago. I miss uh, 
all y'all's hometown and what you're all doing out there. And I know a lot of you are sheltering in place as well, so you're not enjoying a lot of the beautiful parts of the city. But uh, but uh, no, I have uh, my wife, Melissa, and my son, Josh, and, and we've been um, playing a lot of video games and, and playing board games inside. And, and we've been doing some some small wanderings around the city, getting walks in, taking our dog for walks. And just, um, you know, one thing, uh, my boss at Dialogue Tech, Leon, we, we, we talked early on with all this, and he was very, very much, you need to get some fresh air every day. So um, I started taking some walks sometimes, like around lunchtime, just around my block, and uh, that helped a lot. So we're getting by. Yeah, that's a good good advice. Like, just make sure you're getting around. Your mind can't just be in that one space. Go outside for a walk. Always get to mix it up. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Uh, are you uh, are you ready to start your talk? I'm ready. I'm excited. Let's go do it. Let's do it. Uh, if you can share your screen, I can get it up on the broadcast. <clears throat> All right, cool. We have your screen shared. Cool. Let me get it back up. Okay, cool. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for taking the time tonight. Um, this is my first virtual where I can't see your presentation. All I see is the mic and camera in front of me. But um, if you have any questions along the way, I know uh, Ali's going to help me manage questions through the through the live chat and um, my uh, Twitter and everything is at the end of all this. My email's on the screen right now. Feel free to hit me up. I'm also in the Chicago Python Slack. If you want to reach out to me there, I'm happy to take questions and and help out wherever I can. So let's get started. So um, we kind of talked a little about me. I think I'll skip over this one just for, for brevity. Um, so we're gonna take a little step back from NLP and we're gonna talk about audio data because you, um, at least in, in Dialogue Test case and the work that I do, we start from audio data. We start from that phone conversation, then we work our way into the text and then the NLP on top of it. So um, at Dialogue Tech, we're firm believers about um, having cleaned foundational data helps us to um, have better results downstream. If your audio is not in good formats and being properly managed and maintained, um, if, you're, if you're not having good practices there at the audio level, um, it's, it's not going to translate into good results in your transcription, which could lead to uh, issues with some of your modeling and prediction and things like that. So we're gonna talk about audio data. We're gonna talk about tools you can use to explore audio files on your, on your system. We'll talk about ways we can get features from those audio files. Um, we're gonna do a little bit of classification on top of that audio data uh, with an example. And then we're gonna shift into transcription NLP. And there's a lot of, a lot of content here and I wanna make sure Lorena has a, um, a lot of content and time for her, her talk. So I'm gonna be a little brief through some of these early slides, but uh, rest assured the uh, slides will all be shared out. It's, uh, the, the, all the code is in my GitHub. I'm, I'm happy to help you work through it later on or pair up something if you'd like to at the, at the end, um, down the road. So the first thing I like to talk about is, is how we as humans actually hear sound. And when you take a step back and think about it, um, what we're really hearing is that um, difference in um, variation of pressure um, that makes sound for us. So that your, your ears are getting sound waves being created by different pressures from my voice speaking out loud. And that's how we hear things. So when you look at that at a, at a, at a human level, at, a, at a, how we hear sound, um, the picture I have up here is of your uh, your ear system from your outer ear to your inner ear all the way through to your nervous system. So when that sound kind of rolls into your ear, down the ear canal, into your eardrum, if you look to the far right, you see a little snail looking thing called the cochlea. Inside that cochlea, um, there is what's called the basilar membrane. That Think of that as like a, a, a strip of, of, um, of hair follicles um, inside there. And as the sound um, moves across it, it starts to make a wave looking pattern. Um, and those hair follicles rub against the cochlea and that generates electricity. Um, when you hear things, you're literally generating electricity inside your, your ears. Um, those signals, that electricity is then transferred to your auditory nerve and that gets carried to your, to your brain for, for us to interpret as, as sound as humans. So kind of parlaying from that, how's a computer hear sound? So on the top of this diagram, you have an, we have an analog um, sound wave, on the bottom a digital sound wave. And what we're really doing is we're just sampling the data. We're just converting those air pressures in the analog. And over time, at a given sampling rate, we are capturing that information and we're looking at the voltage in that, um, we're calculating the voltage in that uh, signal. And that's giving us our ones and zeros at the on the bottom digital output. That's that's kind of a very rough explanation of digital to audio uh, digital audio conversion. 
getting a little bit deeper in the sound wave characteristics, um, the two I always talk about around this are uh, amplitude and frequency. If when you look at amplitude on the left diagram, that's the, the height of the wave um, from zero. So um, I look at it this way, the more amplitude, the higher the wave goes up. Think about like an amplifier, right? If you have an amplifier in your car or your home audio system, um, you're amplifying that sound, you're increasing the, the loudness of it. The, the, um, the, sound wave is getting, the sound wave is getting bigger and taller to give you more amplitude and, and louder sound. Um, on, the, on the diagram on the right-hand side, you're looking at wavelengths. So the shorter the wavelength and the, the higher your frequency, um, the, the more often that wavelength travels across the zero mark, the higher your frequency of sound, and contrary to the, the low frequency with longer wavelengths, uh, but that's giving you, um, that's going to translate into the pitch of the sound you're hearing. So you have the loudness and the pitch kind of within these two characteristics. And one thing to really consider when you're talking about working with audio data is how are you sampling that data? How is your system taking the audio being spoken and actually sampling it into your, your files, into your wave files or your audio files, let's say. So on this diagram, we have um, a sound wave in blue, an analog signal. And each of those uh, points in red are the uh, are digital samples. The interval between those those red lines is called the sampling rate. Um, that is just the regular interval that we're, where we're taking a sample of the wave. Um, typically, you're going to see sampling rates ranging from eight kilohertz all the way up to twenty two point five megahertz. Uh, very large spread there. So eight kilohertz, you can think of as like your typical phone call. Um, uh, for an audio recording like MP3 format, you're going to see like forty four point one kilohertz. The larger killer, uh, the larger like megahertz type type uh, frequencies are a lot of like high quality production equipment you're going to see in like movie theaters and, and and movie systems and things like that. But the thing I always talk about here as well is it's not just a sampling rate, but it's the bit depth that you need to consider here as well. So the sampling rate is how often you're grabbing a um, a sample of that wave, and of course the higher the sampling rate, the more often you're taking a sample. Um, so the bet the the easier it'll be for you to reconstruct and play that audio with better quality. Uh, when you go to, to play it to someone's human ears. But then the bit depth is actually the measure of how much data you're taking per sample. So you're sampling uh, at the sampling rate and you're grabbing the, the number of bits in the bit depth. And typically you're gonna see one, two or three bytes, eight, 16, 24 bits. Uh, but the, the thing to remember here and take away from this is that um, the higher the sampling rate, the more often you're sampling, the higher the bit rate, the more data you're getting per sample that you can use for your, for your processing. Another thing to consider as well are the audio file formats. The uh, common audio file formats uh, that we use at Dialogtech are typically WAV files. Uh, we try to keep our sound in the uh, uncompressed loss, lossless format that we can use. Um, so we wanna try to minimize the amount of loss we have in the data in the file when we save it to WAVE so we can put it into our longer term storage after we've processed it. Um, you can also use FLAX. Uh, FLAX are, um, Technically a lossless uh, compressed format, they, they will usually save you around 30 to 40% of, of storage size. Um, the, the issue I've typically seen is that they may not be as widely usable in other systems. You may not be able to play them in all web browsers, other things like that. Um, MP3s are a more standard format, but again, you get to a, a, a lossy com uh, compressed format. You get a lot of space back in your environment. It costs you less to store them in the cloud storage. You, know, you save 75, 95% of, of the size compared to WAV files but you are, uh, you are definitely going to lose um, data when you save down to MP3. So um, things to keep in, in consideration when you're talking about working with audio data and files. Um, some else to consider too here are the number of channels in your data and your application. So typically an audio file with one channel is a mono file. Even if there's multiple speakers on that file, uh, on that sound wave, um, if, they're, if they're mixed down into one channel, um, one piece of data that's just a, a mono audio file. Um, typically, a good rule of thumb is to have one channel per speaker in the conversation. Think about a typical phone call. Um, you and I are talking on the phone, you're in channel one, I'm in channel two. This gives us all of the bits of data at the sampling rate within those channels so that we get the best quality data capture per speaker on the, on the conversation. Um, that would again parlay into, um, if you and I are talking at the same time and maybe we talk over each other, um, there's a better chance of being able to catch some of those words that were spoken if you have the channels separated out um, in the actual wave file. Um, so moving on for some features of audio, uh, quick uh, couple of ideas on some tools. I love socks, love, love, love the tool socks. I install it on a laptop really quickly when I first get one. Um, it's, it's a go-to tool for me in my terminal. 
Um, typically, I use socks dash dash I, uh, passing in a wave uh, a file uh, path, and then out comes just some very basic high level data. So when I'm given a new piece of audio, first thing I'm gonna do is, is socks it and try to see how many channels there are. I have my sample rate, I have my, my bit rate, I have um, a bunch of different, I have the, the duration, the number of samples, I have all the information there that kind of gets me going on it and gets me started with it. Socks is a really great tool. Um, you can look up its uh, man page on SourceForge. Um, it, it's cross-platform, works on, I'm on a Mac right now, it works on you know, Linux and Windows as well. Um, Python, actually, you can pip install a tool called PySox, um, and that actually will wrap around the Sox uh, tool and, and give you uh, direct access to it in, in your Python code. So in addition to uh, Sox, um, if I need to go into the UI and actually see the wave, um, I love the tool Audacity. Um, it's, I, it's a free tool, um, cross-platform. It's It also will do uh, video editing and recording. Um, I typically use it just to get a quick look at the at the wave file. Um, I can I can see from this point how many channels there are. I see how long the, the wave is. I can see kind of where different speakers are in the file. Um, and I can see what's going on with that audio. And I can even play it too to hear the audio. So I can kind of go from my terminal to this tool and I get a lot of information really quickly about a new piece of, a new piece of data. Cool, so let's talk about audio features. Um, so we're gonna take and look at how we can take those, those wave files. Once we go from analog to digital, we have a wave file. Um, how we can extract those features in Python. So we're gonna look at raw audio features, we're gonna talk about spectrograms, chromograms, and finally we're gonna talk about MFCCs are, or MEL frequency substrate coefficients. So first up is raw audio data. Um, this is a five second wave file. Um, this is sampled at 44.1 kilohertz. So when you look at this, you're getting a 1D array of five times 44,100. So 221 roughly uh, thousand elements in the array. And I'm just using, um, I'll show you the code in a second, I'm just using some very standard tools to pull this out and extract it. This is actually, if you're curious, this is me speaking. The first couple seconds there are me uh, saying a few words, I forget the actual words. And then um, that very um, large amplitude uh, at the end there is me clapping my hands uh, as well. So using that same audio file, now that we've loaded it in and we have the raw data, now we can do some math to get into the, our other features that we could use for other work. So first thing we'll look at is spectrograms. And, and you're gonna see a trend here over the next three um, feature extraction elements. We're gonna do a lot of Fourier transforms. And, and I don't know about you, but I haven't done a Fourier transform since college. Um, the good news is you don't, know how to, you don't have to remember how to do them or pull out your old um, math books from college or anything like that. There are some tools that I'll show you in Python that you can use to extract that information and work with it. So this is a spectrogram. This is created effectively by taking the audio, uh, the, digital, the digital data from the audio breaking it up into overlapping time windows, and then doing a Fourier transform over each time window. Um, you're calculating the magnitude of the frequency spectrum inside of that actual window. Then you're plotting that with uh, time on the x-axis, um, uh, frequency on the y-axis, and then the heat map is actually the difference in, um, uh, hold on a second here. I have a note on this, how much I wanna get it right. The, um, the, it's the magnitude of the frequency in the spectrum for that given window. So that's actually your, yeah, your decibels there is your, is your, um, your frequency uh, magnitude. But again, visually speaking, you can kind of see where I'm talking off to the left for the first couple of seconds, and you can see my hand clap there um, off, uh, kind of in the center of the screen. So next are chromograms, and this is a little bit more complex, but chromograms um, are a compare, they're, they're taking your audio and as a comparison between the 12 different pitch classes. Um, you know, C, C sharp, D, C sharp, things like that. So like a spectrogram, we're calculating this feature by dividing the audio into small windows of time. And then we're doing a short time Fourier transform over them. And then what you have here is time on the bottom. And um, the uh, vertical axis is actually, if you look closely enough, it could be hard to tell depending on how, how big your stream is, but um, you're seeing uh, 12 vertical blocks. Um, for every every segment of time. And each of those blocks indicates a different pitch class. And the and if you look to the right, the, the variance in the pitch from your audio to the standard pitch of that pitch class is the is the color. So all the ones that are darker are closer to that pitch class. The ones that are the more in the yellows, oranges, and, and all of that at the top, those are where it's differing from the pitch class. So this is simply just doing a lot of comparisons amongst pitch classes for chromograms. So the last one here are um, MSCCs are longer described as MEL frequency substral coefficients. Uh, try saying that 12 times fast. 
But um, this is actually much more complex mathematically um, to, to calculate and to describe, to be honest. But the, um, there's five steps. So first, you're going to take, same as our other features, you're going to take the audio, split it into uh, your different time windows, and you're going to do your Fourier transform on each window. Next, you're going to take that resulting spectrum um, and map it onto the MEL frequency scale. Then you're going to take a log of powers for each frequency in the MEL scale, and then you're going to do a discrete cosine transform of those powers um, into your MFCCs. And then um, an MFCC technically represents a phoneme or a distinct unit of sound. Um, they're commonly used uh, in uh, speech recognition systems, uh, transcription systems, and audio classification in, uh, environments. So again, you have time here on the bottom, and uh, you have the value of the MFCCs being indicated by the, uh, the colors. OK, let's get some code. So Ali, can you just confirm real quick that you're seeing the, uh, the code here on the stream? Yeah, it looks good. Awesome, thank you. So, um, so all of this, all these demos are available on GitHub. In my, in my GitHub, I'll give you the link at the end. Um, all of this work is done in Python three six, I believe, it might be three seven. Um, and I'm going to talk through all the. And I'm doing, using. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of Jupyter Lab, so I'm demoing a Jupyter Lab. So um, I'm going to not go through every line of code here, just for brevity, just to make sure we have time to get to our transcription and, and LP parts of the conversation. But I'm going to point out the key notes in some of the um, some of the code I have here. So first, thing I want to mention is the package I'm using is called Debrosa. Uh, big fan of Debrosa, really well baked out package, um, and I like it because it has um, the ability to extract features, but it also has um, uh, integration with matplotlib to just generate really nice looking plots that you can use to visualize audio data right here in the notebook. So I have some constants, and then I actually, um, I don't know if my speaker's hooked up here, or my audio, but I, you know, I could play the audio right from the notebook in this next area. And then we're going to start pull, pulling out features. So first thing we do is just load the file up. We, we take the path, and we load in the file, we're both that load. The main thing I want to point out here is that I'm passing in SR equals none. So I'm saying sampling rate equals none. And that's on purpose uh, because um, I actually get the sampling rate. If you look out to the, the results, I get the raw audio and the sample rate. Uh, the sampling rate is, is determined by Labrosa when it loads the file up. It figures it out. Um, if you were to pass in a sampling rate here, if you did not pass in the actual sampling rate of the audio, if you pass in a different number per se, um, it would upsample or dance, downsample your audio for you, which could be a cool feature depending on what you're doing. Um, I didn't want to do any upsampling or downsampling for any of this, so I just left it as none. I wanted Labrosa to do what it does and, and give me the results. And then again, I'm just using Labrosa that display uh, wave plot, and that's integrating with my uh, matplotlib uh, library and just generating a really nice looking plot of the raw audio as well. And then same thing we're going to go through for the spectrogram. There's a feature mel spectrogram. I'm passing in the audio. I now have the sample rate, so I have to give that to the spectrogram so it can do its math. Um, I'm telling it to do um, 512 Fourier transforms um, windows and a hop length of 256 between them. And I, I forget what those parameters exactly mean. That's all in the, in the um, I'm pretty sure those are defaults for this, this function. Those are all defined in the, uh, Labrosa also has a lot of great documentation on their website if you go look it up. Um, and then I convert to decibels so I can display on a graph. And then we visualize it calling um, spectrum show passing in the decibels and um, time on the x-axis. And, and we're generating our spectrogram here as well, uh, right in this notebook. And then again, same, same system here for chroma. We're, we're calling the chroma function, sort, short time Fourier transforms, passing in the audio and the sample rate. I get all my chroma data back out, the raw data. Um, again, I have those 12 pitch classes. So I have a, a size of 12 uh, for 433 uh, that were calculated. And then I'm calling spec show again to generate my chromogram with all of those uh, vertical boxes that are in, involved. And then same for MFCC is just passing in um, the raw audio, the sample rate, and the number of MFCCs I want to calculate um, per window, and then visualizing those as well. So that's that's the code. I really like Labrosa because it, it, you know, a couple lines of code here, and you can you can really do some really powerful things with audio uh, with just looking through a couple of quick docs and, and then getting into the uh, the audio side of things. Cool. So now we've talked about um, audio in general and, and some basic ways to get features out. Let's let's solve a problem. Um, so we're going to do an audio classification problem. Um, I found a system called um, Freesound. It's a um, audio tagging challenge from uh, from Kaggle. I, the data is freely available. I went out and downloaded it. 
Um, there are 41 different sound classes, things like applause, fireworks, um, gunshots, um, uh, different instruments like uh, cellos and trombones. Um, there are over 9,000 labeled examples. So we're gonna take a look at how I explored this data, how I um, split it up into data sets, how I attracted the features, how I trained the model, and, and how we predicted on, on new, um, new examples. So again, we're not gonna go through all the code direct. Um, I'm using pandas to load up CSVs and map to, to visualize some things. Um, I'm reading in the CSV that came in the set. Um, as you can see, I have 9,473 examples. Each example has a file name. So this data set comes with a bunch of files and then this CSV is kind of like the index, if you will, into those files. And then it also has the data you need to train a model. It has a label and it has this feature we're gonna talk about in a second called manually verify true false. Um, you know, just looking at our data here, we have yeah, 9473, we have 41 classes. If I call um, label.unique on, uh, unique on the label column, you can see all the different um, things we have here, glockenspiels, telephones, um, tambourines, fireworks, things like that, finger snapping, um, 41 different classes that are labeled. And the thing I wanted to look at here is that this is a, a open source data set. So I have no idea how the, the labeling process was done, how rigorous it was, if they did um, single labeler per file, or if they did a um, like a voting structure where you have different people uh, label the same file and you take the, I, I don't know how it was done. So what I decided to do for purposes of this exercise is I just did a group by by manually verify and label. And I wanted to see kind of how they distribute, how many examples do we have uh, not verified and verified. And, and some it kind of, I found it varies based on the class. Some classes have a very, somewhat closely evenly distributed like this guitar. Applause is very much not labeled manually or not verified. Um, and this kind of varies by pitch class, and I, uh, um, by, um, kind of by class basically. And I actually wanted to go as far as looking at the visually, I just did a simple stacked bar, bar chart here um, where the uh, blue color is where it's not verified and the orange color is where it is verified. So looking at some of the classes here, um, things like saxophone are very verified. Um, but then you get into a couple of um, like uh, cough and bark are much less verified. So, so we have an a imbalanced situation between the files that are verified and the files that are not verified. So that'll, that'll start to play into how we look at this. So what I decided to do was just ignore and remove all of the non manually verified data. I just filtered my data set to where that manually verified column is one. I found that that had 3,700 examples still um, and decided to give that a shot and see how that performed from a modeling standpoint. So um, as you can see here, we have all the verified information. So the next notebook I have, it's actually in the repo. I'm not gonna go through it all, but I, I had to make a notebook once I did some exploration, I had to get my data um, lined up and, and kind of uh, uh, allocated to where I needed to have it. So I, I basically wrote a script that would, so I used sklearn to do a train test split. Uh, typically I do 80, 20, 80 for train, 20 for test and validation. Um, and then once I had that set, I then went to the data and I looped over all the files and I split them into a train file, a train folder and, and a validation folder. Um, that way I had everything set up statically. I tend to do this statically. I prefer that um, from, a, from a data standpoint. That way, if as you train and fit your model over and over again and try different things, um, you're always comparing your metrics of your model and your performance on the same uh, static data set. So we're not gonna go through the notebook. It's just a bunch of code to move files around and do some other fun stuff. But we are gonna look at is how we actually train a model with that data. So now at this point, we have split our data in a train test. We're only using the manually verified data and we have moved all our files around on our local file system, so we're ready to go. So again, I'm importing a lot of stuff. I'm using uh, Labrosa, Matplotlib, um, Pandas again to load data in, uh, and I'm bringing Keras. So I'm using Keras and TensorFlow to build this model um, that I'm using to, to train on the audio file. So I have a bunch of different uh, constants again, our paths and some other things. Um, and then the, we're not gonna go through this code again. We have all the loading code. We have the, the raw audio visualization. Uh, we go through all the other stuff that we do for MFCCs. The important side of this feature to note is this function right here, get MFCCs. Cause I actually loop over all the files and I generate the MFCCs here. And the thing to take away from this is that uh, typically when training a neural network to uh, do a classification problem, you have to get your data into the same size and shape. So in this case, um, I found the audio files to be of varying length by a little bit, half second or so here and there. Um, so what I decided to do was truncate that at 128 MFCCs. 
And anything over that we would chop and truncate. Anything, if we didn't have enough to get there, we have code that will just pad it in uh, with zeros. So that way we end up with uh, a uniform set of data that we're going to work through. So then further, I just this code here is just looping through my directories and get, gathering all the WAV files. And the, it's these three lines here are the important ones. It's just calling git mfccs on that file. It's getting those back. It's also it's appending it to the overall mfcc list, and then it's taking the category for that one feed, that one file uh, and building out the category list. And then what I'm doing here is just converting to a NumPy array for my X features. I'm doing a little bit of pre-processing on the category list. You can't pass a list of strings into um, a model. You have to you have to pass numbers. Um, so we have our numerical representation of the WAV file in MFCCs, but now we have strings. We have like Cello and Glockus and other things like that. So all I'm doing on this line is just calling uh, two categorical and the carriage utilities that is effectively doing a one hot distribution. Think of this outputting per um, per audio file. It's giving back um, a 40, 41 um, entry wide vector that has uh, 40 zeros and one of those are gonna be set to one for the corresponding class that it is. And then um, one thing I've done that I've learned the hard way is uh, at this point, you've done a lot of pre-processing, save. Save your data, um, just calling numpy.save to numpy files here. I'm saving my features for X and Y. I'm saving my label encoder. I'm just saving things so that if my, if my modeling uh, borks my system here, I can, I can just reload the notebook and start back over. I don't have to go through that. Um, data um, extraction process again. So this whole notebook, these next six lines are the model. So I'm using Keras again, so I'm, def I'm building a sequential model. My first layer is, is batch normalization layer. So what this is, what I'm trying to do with this is that um, there is a, as you saw in that one chart, there is an imbalance of examples uh, manually verified across different categories. Um, so what I'm trying to do is ensure that for every batch of data I process, we have relatively equal amounts of data from each category as best we can. Um, just trying to avoid batches that come through that have um, a bunch of trombones and, and nothing of anything else and things like that. Um, then I have two different LSTM layers. I'm using um, LSTMs here um, because I wanted a type of neural network that, um, that has memory about previous information because an audio file has a time series component to it. So I wanted a type of model that, that, that observes and uses that, that time series, that memory component. Um, if you haven't used an LSTM before, um, I really love going to, there's a website I can share a link later um, that has all the different neural network architectures um, drawn out really nice and clean. Um, I think it's called Asimov Zoo, neural network zoo.com. I'll, I'll look it up. Um, so I have 128 units and 32 units. I'm using dropout on both of my layers. Uh, what I'm doing there with dropout is I'm trying to avoid overfitting. Um, when I'm setting dropout, what I'm telling it is that um, when you're training this, this layer, randomly select nodes that you're going to remove and, and remove from the, from the network. That way you're trying to avoid different nodes that latch on to features that may not be generalizable to that data. So you're trying to avoid overfitting. Um, then I pump all that into a dense layer. That's 41 uh, softmax layer. That's um, 41 um, outputs wide. Um, I'm using categorical cross entropy. I'm using the atom optimizer and I'm using categorical accuracy as my metrics. And then model.fit passing in X, giving it the Y. Um, I trained this on a MacBook Pro, so I do a very small batch size of 16, and we're doing 50 epochs. And if you look at the results that are pumped out here by the, by the trainer, um, you see this loss column here in the middle. We start off 3.6, we start training ourselves down to 2.0. And if I keep scrolling down, I get down to like 0.8 or 0.9, 0.87. Um, so I'm training the loss out of the network and, and trying to make it as um, predictive as possibly can. The um, one thing I kind of do sometimes is look through the summary is to see what kind of parameters I have and just kind of double checking that my network sizes look right. And, and yep, 128 makes a lot of sense um, for the MSCCs. And um, that's, my, that's my max size I picked earlier. And then um, we get down to this 41 uh, output uh, size. And again, save it. You've trained it, you spent a lot of time, probably hours training that, um, save it, um, save it to disk. And then next thing we wanna do is see how we did. How, how we're performing. So all I'm doing here is just converting one uh, random file I picked out of the training, uh, out of the validation set um, and converting it to MFCCs. And the next line down there, I'm just calling model.predict. And I'm getting out 41 numbers. Um, those, are, those are the probabilities per class of what that file is. So to get the actual prediction or the, or the strongest prediction, I'm just doing an argmax on the whole thing. 
Um, and then I'm indexing into the label encoder classes to get back the uh, string representation of what that class is as a bass drum. So that worked out well. One for one, we're doing pretty good, right? Um, let's, let's keep playing along. So um, what I really want to do is do validation on my entire validation set. Um, so I load that up down here. I have 742 examples. Um, I added a predicted label column. And then this code is just literally over, uh, looping over top of the um, model, excuse me, of the files, getting MSXCs again, uh, model.predict, and then putting that into the data set. Um, and you can see out of the first five and the, the way I called dot head uh, on the data frame, um, three out of five. So we're doing, we're doing okay. But what I really want to see is are my, um, my F1 scores are some kind of metric of how I'm doing per category. Um, and the higher the F1 score here, the better I'm doing. And it kind of is a mixed bag. Doing great on acoustic guitars, uh, kind of a coin flip on buses, um, really poorly on computer keyboards and other things like that. So, uh, but overall, a, a weighted average of, of, of a 0.6, so uh, a little better than a coin flip. So, pretty pretty good for a uh, for a MacBook Pro. Um, cool. So, kind of recapping the results here, um, we built a model using MFCCs on this data set. We came out with an average F1 score of 0.6. Um, Kind of okay, not great. Um, you notice that some categories were higher or lower. How could we improve this? Well, some things that we could do are we could um, uh, train for more than 50 epochs. That would probably involve getting off of some other, other hardware uh, using a GPU or some other things to speed things up. Maybe rework how we're truncating features. Maybe try to go to 256 or 512 for our, our size of our features. Um, and then we could possibly tune our LSTM um, or use a, use a different kind of model, maybe a CNN or some kind of RNN style model uh, to, to do this work. So that's a lot about audio and predicting. Let's kind of shift gears into the text side of things to talk about how we go from audio to text. So again, at Dialogue Tech, we very much are focused on um, having quality data at every step in our process. So we try to get as best quality audio as we can, and then we try to get best quality transcriptions as we can. So um, when you're looking at transcription, uh, you're looking at a couple of things. Number one, you're obviously converting recorded conversations to text, recorded audio to text. Um, and then you're, you want to use as high quality equipment as you can. Sometimes you can't control it. For uh, the work that we do, it's all, it's all usually phones, uh, phone receivers, cell phones, desk phones, things like that. Um, if you can control your uh, equipment using high quality mics and things like that, awesome. More The better off you are. Um, you want to try to set the lossless formats, waves, and flat files. And again, you want to record one speaker each channel. And depending on your environment and when your needs for transcription, you might use an API. Uh, you might do some on-premise. It just depends on what you want to do. You can hand roll, you can roll your own and train your own model. There's toolkits out there like Caldi and other things like that. There's some notes on Caldi in the in the slide deck uh, if you want to grab it when, when we when we post it. But um, you can you can do lots of different ways to do your transcription depending on what's best for you and, and for your needs. If you do choose to go to the cloud with it and do an API, um, one thing that my team tries to stay on top of is the ever ever changing models and, and quality of our transcription providers. And some of the ones we normally test around this slide, um, we test at AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure. Um, we, we typically will take a standard set of audio files and we'll run them through these vendors and we'll do what's called a word error rate calculation um, per, per, um, per audio file. And what that really is calculating, uh, if you look it up, is just um, the ratio of insertions and deletions basically differences in the, in, the, in the text versus the number of words that should have been in the text. So it's kind of trying to figure out the ratio of, of how uh, good or bad it did on that given call. OK, quick demo on that. So next up here, we're going to talk about transcribing audio files. And um, I'm going to skip over all the little browser stuff. We've been through all of that, and I want to keep us moving. So um, we're going to roll down to. Uh, the bottom here to the last section of this. Um, what I'm really doing with this is I'm just loading up and doing chromograms and everything and, and pulling features from um, debates. So um, I do that for every debate that we have the, um, in the 2016 cycle. So I downloaded some audio from the debates in that cycle, um, and I, I had them transcribed through um, AWS Transcribe. So I'm trying AWS here. I really like this, this tool. It's a really great, um, really well baked into the AWS um, system. If you're, if you're already using AWS for other, other workloads in your system, it, it shouldn't be a, a very large leap to pull it into your environment. So um, in Python, I'm using Boto3. I'm just starting up a session. And step one is I'm uploading the audio file to, um, we're using MP3s here, 
So I'm uploading an audio MP3 file into uh, this bucket key um, for uh, transcribe. I'm just doing a quick post to the bucket, putting it up there. And then I'm loading up the transcription client and I'm telling it to transcribe, uh, giving it a job name, um, passing in the sample rate, passing in the, the bucket I wanna put it out to. And then I walk away, it goes and does its thing. Um, and then you can just, uh, when it's ready, you can use the S3 client again to download that transcription and pull it out of the bucket uh, and download it to your local system to work with. And if you're curious what one of those look like, I happen to have a couple right over here. So when you're looking at transcription systems, you want to look at a couple of different things. Uh, number one, you want a system that gives you back the entire transcription. I'm not going to blow it out or it'll just kill my browser. But you also want to look at one uh, a system that gives you each word individually. And if I look at a random word here in the first couple, um, you also, it's really great that they can give you the start times and end times of those words. It'll help out with other an analysis later so that you can um, line up those words and you can see what kind of words are being said at different times in the call. You, you don't just want this the string of text. It's, it's really good to get other um, metadata around each, each spoken word. Um, and when, I, when I go into the word here, I actually say that the person was saying here uh, was the word at this, at this uh, index of the call. And the confidence rate, if you get a confidence rate from your vendor, all the better because um, you can use that downstream in some of your processing. Maybe you want to throw out words below a certain confidence threshold or things like that. Um, or maybe you want to calculate the confidence for an entire sentence based on the words in it. And if it falls below a threshold, you want to uh, remove that sentence from your modeling and or other things. So if you, if you find data that's not, um, get your system's not um, confident in that it got, it got a good transcription on. Okay, so now that we've gone from text, uh, now that we've gone from audio to text and transcription, we're gonna talk about some NLP. Uh, we're gonna talk about lexical analysis, um, syntactic, syntactic analysis, and, and semantic analysis. Um, and, and what we're gonna do here is we're gonna look at three different examples. We're gonna talk about keyword spotting, um, ways you can look up just simple keywords um, and search through these calls. Um, we're gonna talk about topic modeling and um, we're gonna wrap up with sentiment analysis. So, um, We'll talk about the demos. A lot of good code to go through. So um, first thing we're going through here is, so again, I'm using the, the debate uh, MP3s. I'm using the .json files, the transcripts. All I'm, put that away, there we go. Um, all I'm doing here is opening up the transcript. I'm loading the entire transcript here. I'm not going word by word. I'm just loading up the entire string of text. And I'm doing some very basic pre-processing. I'm just removing stop words of the things like that is, those kind of words, just pulling out some very basic stop words. And then I'm, oh, I didn't mention, I'm using uh, Gensim. I really love, there's lots of different tools you can use for this kind of stuff. There's NLTK, there's Gensim. Um, I, I, I'm blanking on the other ones that are out there, but there's a lot of tools in this space you can use for text cleansing and other things like that. But I like Gensim too, because they also give you some really cool um, methods you can use. So I'm just calling the summarization.keywords here and I'm telling you to give me back a bunch of keywords. And I'm looking at the first 20. So. So we're looking at the, the 20 most used keywords in this first debate in our 2016 cycle. And we're seeing things like countries, um, Americans, uh, businesses, we're talking about a lot of economic things, businesses, uh, the, the Donald, things like that. Then we're looking, equally interesting could be what's not being talked about or what's being talked about less, what kind of, um, in terms of a debate, what kind of topics are candidates pivoting from and not speaking about too much. So some words that come up at the bottom of the list and least common words are, um, hoping, sitting, foreign. We must have punted on foreign affairs discussions in this first debate. Um, private, things like that. So I did that for each debate in here. We're not gonna go through all, all of them, but just a really easy couple lines of code to go from a transcription to just some very basic keyword-based insights into that, into that conversation. So again, kind of parlaying into the next um, side of this, maybe you don't wanna just look up a list of keywords. Maybe you wanna look up and see um, all the different keywords that are being used, or you won't be able to search for, for given keywords. So um, again, I'm using a tool uh, in Gensum. I'm loading up my debates, I'm loading up, um, in this case, I'm loading up all the debates at one time, uh, debate one, two, and three in the VP debate. And I'm just calling get text on those files, getting the text out. And then I'm doing some, again, some basic pre-processing, right? So I'm I'm actually, in this case, I, I went to sentences. So I'm, I'm calling Gensum's uh, get sentences function. So for every debate, I'm just going through each sentence, and for each sentence, I'm doing some cleansing steps. I'm removing the stop words again. I'm stemming text, um, removing punctuation, and stripping any kind of extra white spaces from that sentence. And then I add them to a, um, 
a list of clean sentences and then add those to a list of docs. Important to note here too, there's two different, lots of ways to clean text. Um, but sometimes I bounce around between stemming your text and doing what's called uh, lemmatization on your text. And, the, and the, the key difference there in my mind is um, they're both trying to get to the root of words. And it's really good for cases like this when you're trying to do keyword searching because if you're if you're trying to search for, um, let's say, uh, the word drive, you know, drive, drives, driving, things like that, you you don't, if you want to not have to put in all of those permutations of the word, you can go back to its stem and look for any use of that word. Um, but when you do stemming, uh, a stem can, in some cases, be a non-English word, uh, the stem of a given word. Uh, with a lemma, uh, lemmas will be that smaller version of the word, that, that stripped down version, but lemmas are typically guaranteed to be, to always stop at a given English word. So in this case, I'm also searching for the word taxes. I wanted to know in these debates, where we're talking about taxes. So I have my search phrase of the taxes, and I'm, I, one thing I always do is you do the same thing to your, the text you're going to search to your search call, uh, phrase. Um, that way they're, they're one-to-one, apples-to-apples -apples comparison, and you're not trying to do searching um, on words that are not following the same pattern that the search criteria of the, of the overall text. So I'm calling the same four functions. Um, and as you can see, when we cut down to stems with this, we get to tax. So now we're gonna look for the word tax in all of you. So all I'm really doing here is looping over um, all the docs. I'm just searching for these keywords. Um, and then I, at the end, I print out that uh, basically about 40-ish times in these debates we talked about taxes. Um, we talked about them less. The first two rows there are the, are the presidential debates. As we led up towards the, um, the, the trend was downward in discussion about taxes as we got closer to the election. People wanted to avoid talking about them, so it seems. Um, but again, you can put in any search phrase you want in this notebook, and you can do lots of searching for different phrases or, or things being discussed. You can look at different words. So, so that's um, a couple of examples around keywords. Um, let's take another look at a couple more options here. Just checking my, checking my time real quick. Um, so further, um, we're going to talk about topic modeling. So. What we've done so far has been this been kind of 101 level. We're just we're just looking through our text for um, for different uh, for different keywords and phrases, um, which in a lot of cases is very helpful. Um, you can build very complex algorithms around uh, different keywords and phrases, and and the number of occurrences they happen in those in those conversations. If you pull in those those numeric features for your timing for your timings, you can determine if um, those discussions. Looking at a phone call, you can talk. You can see if those key phrases and words are being used up front in the beginning part of the call? Are they being used during the middle discussion or are they being, being used during the call to action at the end? Um, things like that. You can kind of start to, to add different aspects to your analysis, to your data, just by getting more information from keywords and, and the surrounding metadata around those keywords. But if you want to do a little more unsupervised approach, we can do some topic modeling. So uh, in this example, we're using Jensen again for cleaning. That's kind of a trend through all these notebooks. Um, we bring in um, NLP to help out, help us out with some parsing, and we, um, I really love this tool I found called PyLDA Viz that we'll, we'll look at the end. Um, and again, we're loading up our transcriptions, we're loading up our data, we're defining a couple helper functions. Um, we're using space, space for our lemmatization, so we're looping over all of our sentences and doing lemmatization here. We're just kind of defining some functions up front. Uh, our list of files here, and then we're looping over um, all of the files, we're doing some very simple pre-processing, we're moving stop words, we're calling our lemmatization function, passing in all of our, our data, and then we're creating um, a dictionary uh, from our corpora using Gensum, and then we're, we're creating a, a, a bag of words uh, implementation of a corpus from that data, we're generating a bag of words, because uh, we need to pass those into the overall LDA model. And um, LDA stands for, I'm gonna try to pronounce it right, uh, latent Dirichlet allocation. Um, it's a statistical based um, unsupervised um, topic modeling um, uh, tool uh, function that I'm passing in my corpus, my dictionary, um, my number of topics. I think I put 10 in here. You can make that a parameter and you could kind of play with it a little bit. Um, and then when you when this is all done running, this is going to load up all the text and it's it's generating um, different uh, topics, if you will. And for every word inside of those topics, for every word is trying to see which topic it groups into better, which ones are, is it more similar with, where does it fit? 
Um, and then you can print it right here, right? And this is super helpful, but you can definitely see the first five um, topics give you um, their uh, score and then the, uh, the the word, which is looks really complex to parse in general. Uh, but um, I like to visualize things. So I love Pi LDA Viz. Um, you can pip install it on your local environment. You can run it in notebook mode. You can run it in, um, uh, in a script if you like as well to generate these outputs. But this is gonna give you a uh, cluster plot of your topic model. So you can, you can provide a little better viz around your um, um, your uh, implementation. And I, I know working with my product manager, Lori, at Dialogue Tech, that she is a huge fan of viz. We talk about it all the time. And I, I know I've shown her this and she loves it. But um, the data didn't work out that well here for me. It really clustered really heavily around one and uh, not so great around these other clusters. But what you can do here is when you hover over one, it highlights the words and you're, you're seeing the top 30, I believe, most salient topics. And um, the, I think I zoomed in a little too much here and it's, it's cutting things off, but these, um, the graph to the right are telling you the, um, how often or how frequently they're being used in the overall corpus. So the ones with the longer bar, it would be a little longer if I had not zoomed in, um, are being used a little bit more. But you can see in this topic, this topic picked up on things like American, president, um, state, secretary, um, things like that. And you can play with the parameters on this and try to get this uh, tweaked and dialed in all day long. Um, it's a really cool tool to do some, some uh, topic modeling with your, with your system, with your text. OK, so finally, we're going to finish up a sentiment analysis. And um, so in sentiment analysis, you're trying to look at the text in your um, transcription, and you're trying to get a feel for the polarity of the conversation. Um, and you're looking at that from, a, from, the, from the lens of um, positive, neutral, and negative, right? So um, I actually changed it up and pulled in NLTK here. And I'm using a tool called, um, called Vader within the Natural Language Toolkit. Uh, I actually have a link here to the paper for Vader. Uh, but it's basically is a, um, it's a rules-based sentiment analysis trained on, I, I believe it's Twitter data. I'd have to go look that up. Um, I, I'm not sure what they use to train it on text-wise. But the... Um, all I'm doing here is just implementing LTK, again, loading my transcriptions. I'm um, tokenizing each sentence, creating my tokens. I'm generating a, I'm creating a sentiment intensity analyzer object. And then I'm looping over each sentence and getting the sentiment score for the, for the given sentence and adding it to my output array. And at the end here, I'm just taking my overall scores, positive, neutral, negative, and dividing them by the number of sentences to kind of get a ratio overall and I can see that of my 1,181 sentences, um, fairly neutral conversation in that first, uh, this is the first, first debate I used here. Yeah, first debate. Um, fairly neutral conversation. Um, there was a little bit of uh, positive conversation in there as well, 0.13. Um, not a lot of negativeness as far as what Vader thinks. Um, so with anything in data science, get more opinions, do more, uh, do more analysis, see what other tools say or what other models say or other fits say. Um, so I also wanted to show all of you, if you don't want to um, uh, build your own sentiment tool, uh, there's an API for that as well. Uh, and again, going back to the AWS ecosystem, uh, the AWS Comprehend API is super straightforward to use, um, kind of pluggable right into the Boto3 architecture. So again, I'm opening up this text transcript. I'm um, creating a Comprehend client in Boto. And the only, I guess, downside to the Boto uh, to the AWS Comprehend API is that it has a max of 5K bytes. So you can only send 5,000 characters to it at one time. So when I'm passing it into the text sentiment, I'm actually just passing in um, the first 5,000 bytes here in my, in my uh, object. And then out comes my result. Overall, it was neutral, but I get the score by category. Um, neutral wasn't overwhelmingly 0.75, um, positive 0.18, and, uh, and, and negative 0.2. So that kind, of, that kind of gels with what we got before. We're only looking at the first 5,000 bytes, but we got overwhelmingly neg negative and we got a, you know, a, a little bit of positive kind of sprinkled in there. That's only for the first 5,000 characters, the first you know, X amount of minutes or time of the debate. What happened at the end of the debate? You know, what, what, did the discussion change? Did they get more negative? Was there more mudslinging? Um, what happened? So what we can do here is we're passing in the bottom, the, the final 5,000 characters into the end of the debate, into the transcription, uh, into the Comprehend API, and out comes uh, a little more negative at this point. Um, so our negative number went up to 0.6, and we're leaning a little more negative. We got a little bit uh, muzzling here down the stretch as we wrap things up, so it seems. Um, so again, just different things that you can do with sentiment 
uh, APIs, different toolkits. Um, you can you can always train your own sentiment model if you'd like as well. Um, but there's lots of good things to to glean from from gathering sentiment of your of your texts of your conversations. So um, this is actually a quick picture I'm going to show. This is a uh, um, not of data I was using, but of uh, different data. This is a really cool looking cluster. I think it might actually be from the uh, PyLDA Viz website, but um, you can Google PyLDA Viz. It's a really, really helpful tool for um, for visualizing the data. And you can kind of see um, the top three most relevant tokens, and then um, the the bars are showing you the um, uses of those tokens inside of the inside of the, the corpus. Uh, and the sentiment analysis, again, what, some of the things you can do with stuff like this is um, voice of the customer type things. Think about customer service. Um, could you build a system that in real time is calculating um, the polarity and the, and the sentiment of the conversation between your agent and the and the caller? And if it goes uh, below a certain threshold or a certain feature characteristics, could it, could it flag a supervisor or let someone know to, to hop in and help this person out? Um, and you can also use it in the inbound outbound sales market to see um, how well your products are being received by the, by the customer you're speaking with. So in summary, um, we talked about analog and digital audio data characteristics. We talked about how we can get audio um, features from that audio data. We talked about ways that we could train a machine learning model with audio data. We went through a, a, um, a transcription example, and we talked about different ways to do natural language processing with um, uh, different tools and different APIs and um, being able to extract keywords and uh, do some unsupervised topic modeling. And, and finally wrapped up with some uh, sentiment analysis of, uh, of, uh, of debates. Uh, and that's it, everybody. That's, um, thank you all for your time. I'm super stoked to come out here. I, I at least feel closer to Chicago talking to all of you. Um, not that I'll talk to people every day at work who are in Chicago, but um, I look forward to coming back to the city at some point and, and seeing hopefully some of you in, in person six feet away. But um, here's the GitHub where this all is at. Um, we can post it in the Slack channel maybe later, if you like, and uh, there's my email address. and. Uh, you can find me on the Twitters or in the Chicago Python Slack. Uh, if we have time before Lorraine has to get started, I'm happy to take a few questions and, and talk through some things. But thank you all for your time and um, hit me up any questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ryan. Can we please Welcome. give Ryan a round of applause in the chat? That was a fantastic talk. I learned a lot about, I mean, it's also my second time seeing it, but I learned a lot more, <laughs> understood a lot more this time. Uh, we did have some questions trickling in, but if you do have questions, please ask them down below. And if you did like this uh, talk, go down and hit that like button. Show Ryan how much you really liked it. Awesome. Uh, so the first question is coming from Tony. Do you know if limiting the number of MFCCs affects the accuracy of your model? Yes, I think it does. I actually, um, so when I was building this, so at the time I didn't, so in the time between I built this talk and, and, and when I, um, um, and now, I actually did not have a really nice gaming rig or, or machine learning rig at home. I actually have it sitting like two feet away from me uh, with an, uh, a Titan X, uh, or actually a 10 ETI uh, GPU. So I, I was kind of limited to just burning uh, my MacBook Pro to the ground and seeing if it could, it could manage. So I was using probably uh, smaller, um, less MSCCs. And I, I tried to expand it out a little bit and shorten my batch size. And I did see a little better results, but I kept, I kept, uh, I actually, crashed my computer one night, letting it train overnight. So I decided to, to punt on that and just stick with what worked. Um, but no, I actually would, if somebody wants to grab this code, I may even try it on my, mach on my machine. If you if you tried to get a little larger, maybe, maybe go up to 256 of the MFCCs or whatever it might be, um, you you would see, I forget the exact numbers, but I think you would see some some better results. Was that uh, like a pandemic build for your PC? <laughs> no, I actually built this um, some sometime in the last year. I forget exactly when I did it, but... Uh, yeah. No, I, I wanted a machine that I can play um, some uh, some games on, and I also have it still booting into Linux, so I, I can throw some data on here and play around with it. I actually set it up to where um, I can SSH to it from anywhere in the in the world. I have a uh, DNS into it, things like that too. So that's awesome. Really helpful if you're working with a lot of data. If you don't want to carry that data around with you, um, you can just SSH in from Wi-Fi and and do your thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I always say I'm making a PC for neural networks, but uh, Crusader Kings 3 is coming out, and I think definitely think that's even, that needs a new build. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so do you see any problems trying to identify sentences from off-the-cuff speech? Are there problems with run-ons and incomplete sentences? Do you or does GenSim have ways of dealing with this? There, there can be problems. I am I'm unaware of how GenSim handles it. I've not gone into it that deeply, but um, there's... 
there can be problems with um, off the cuff sentences, but there can also be problems with some transcription systems don't put the proper punctuation in. Um, so, because they're kind of guessing a little bit, so to speak. You're kind of, I, I, you're, you're basically, if you think about the transcription system, you're looking for uh, a pause. And how long of a pause do you get before you put a period in there? Um, it, it, it may not be as accurate as you would like it to be. So when going to sentences, sometimes it can, it can get a little bit uh, more challenging. I, I have not found great ways to, to work with that. Sometimes you just have to play with hyperparameters and, and try to get as close as you can. Awesome. Uh, so we have another question. Uh, for LTA, how, many how do you decide how many topics you're going to use? So I try to start small so that I can kind of see how things cluster and, and not put a lot of stress on my system. So I'll start like around three or five and then go out to 10. And you can, you can start to see um, one thing you're looking for sometimes is the amount of overlap. If you do like 100 clusters, if they're all overlapping over each other, those are not... Um, technically linear, linearly separable. So when you try to model on them, it could be hard to pick out different features. Um, so you kind of want to just, I, I literally, I just keep messing around with hyperparameters and trying to find that sweet spot where I'm minimizing my overlap, um, but but getting enough clusters to re re represent my text. And and kind of from there, that's just more giving you intuition into the data. If you're, if you're going to use that text data for any kind of modeling or things like that, you're going to want to do human labeling, um, classification and other other stuff. So you can, you can have more uh, human eyes on that data. It's kind of more of an intuition. Uh, and, and helpful research. Yeah, that makes sense. I feel like a lot of these answers are, it depends on what you're trying to do. A lot of times, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I believe this is related to the sentiment analysis. So what does the compound score type mean? What's up, Darius? Um, <laughs> Darius is actually a colleague of mine at, uh, at Dialog Tech. So What's up, Darius? Thanks for joining the stream. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for hanging out. Um, so I, I actually... I forget why I, I ignored the compound sentences. I think I wanted to keep it simpler for this, but I I, I think compound was some of that back to the run on question a little bit as well. It, it was more of a of a, of a compound um, phrases that that got put together in a in a weird way. Uh, I'm not really sure what else. I had to go look at it. I, I I know in my analysis it didn't it didn't look. I'm not sure I even had any compounds. I I put that code in because I just wanted to prevent it getting into the. I really wanted to stick to that um, neutral uh, neutral positive thing. Stuff. Awesome. And so uh, our last question is, do you have any free transcription tool recommendations? Wow, great question. Um, a lot of these vendors, I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but I think AWS will give you um, um, free hours. If you're if you're in a Microsoft world, um, uh, Azure does a lot of this as well. I think if you have like a, a .NET subscription, they give you like X hours per month. So I've known a lot of people that will try to maximize their free hours from the subscriptions as well. And if you sign up for uh, accounts from Amazon, you get those free like intro accounts. They usually uh, give you 25 or 100 hours or things like that as well. Um, but I, I, I don't have a good example of one that's totally free all the time. I, I've honestly not found that per se. Um, if you want a free one, I would actually look into building my own. I would go look at Caldi or some other toolkit that you can find different data sets and train uh, your own transcription system from, from that, if, if that suits your needs. But if you wanted to do a quick API, I would find some way to kind of juggle my way through email addresses and getting Amazon to give you some, uh, some transcripts back. Awesome. So I guess I have a question. Have you ever analyzed sure. like this talk? Uh, no, honestly, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, I actually just found a really great data set um, it's it's, a, it's, a, it's published by Google. It's called Audio Set. If you, if you Google the word Audio Set or Audio Set um, Training Set or whatever it might be, um, Google published it, and it's actually a set of video clips from YouTube. Um, and the data set is is a link to the YouTube clip, and the I, the duration and offset of the of the sound of the bird or the car or whatever it might be. And um, I really want to play with that because what you have to do is actually access the audio. Uh, from the way from the from the video. So in this kind of a of, of a of a stream like we're doing now, you have to find a way to segment um, the video out and just get to the audio component from that. And I believe there I have not done it. I believe there are tools in the Python world. I'm sure there are to do that. But uh, but no, actually that'd be kind of cool if I actually could I analyze this and find ways to improve it. That's a that's a great point. So I think uh, like so when we're doing it on YouTube, like tomorrow morning, it's going to get processed overnight, and uh, we're going to have everything like captioned as well. So if you want to play around with the data. It's all available to you. The captions definitely help too. That's great. Yeah, I might do that for sure. Okay, I'll, I'll hit you up if you need help with the API to just get that information. Cool. Awesome. And uh, before we let you go, do you have any calls to action for our community? Oh wow, calls to action. Um, you know, I, I, 
I've been following the Cleveland and Chicago um, COVID responses and talking to a lot of people. And I, I think um, a lot of people are doing a lot of good things to keep themselves safe. And I just encourage you to keep doing that. Um, now, now is the time to um, invest in yourself while you're at home and while you're kind of staying distant. Uh, you're not going out to, 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 to bars and grabbing drinks with friends. Um, there's a lot of stuff you just talked about. Um, you can you can look into Kegel course, uh, um, Coursera courses, or other things like that, and and use some of your time. You know, crack a crack a cold one at home and and uh, and and learn something. So uh, that's that's what I'm trying to do. And I would encourage everyone that has the time to to try to do some of that as well. But uh, definitely stay safe and uh, and try and learn something while you're at home. Yeah, that's definitely fantastic advice. Like, I think one thing we should do is after this is all over, maybe like a pandemic project night where you show off what you've done, like a show and tell. <laughs> Great I've, I've worked cool on idea. a lot of small things, but nothing like, well, nothing good yet. I can't wait to figure out what's next. Awesome. Uh, I'll just want to say before I go, I, uh, thanks for having me. I, I really appreciate what, what you and what Chai, uh, Chai Pai do for uh, for the community, both nationally and in the Chicago area. I mean, this is this has been a really well put together event and um, as they all are. And, uh, you know, thanks for having me. I, I hope to hope to have one at our Dialtech offices or, or join on the stream in the future. That'd be great. Thanks so much for uh, for coming on, and I really appreciate you saying that. And uh, we look forward to uh, to having you back on. Awesome! Thanks, everybody. All right, so that was Ryan Bales talking about how we can learn from audio data. Uh, we're going to take a short break before we uh, have our next speaker, Lorena Mesa, come on and talk about uh, a telenovela she wrote with a little bit of deep learning. Stay tuned.
All right, and we're back. Thanks for joining us. My name is Ali Sivji, and you're watching the Chicago Python Data Special Interest Group presents Natural Language Processing. That's a little long. I should probably change that. I think I said that last time, too. All right, so um, I'm going to bring on our next guest to the live stream. I'd like to welcome Lorena Mesa. Hey, Lorena, I think you're muted. Yeah, I'm in the habit of doing that. Um, Thumbs up, how's the audio? Audio is perfect. Hi, awesome. Lorena. So uh, can you please introduce yourself to our audience? Uh, sure, I actually do have a little bit of a space in my talk. So I'll just say, I'm Lorena and I'm here to talk about telenovelas. Uh, so I'll do a little a little of that intro and start in my talk. If that's okay, cool. Uh, can you tell us about how you first got into Python? Sure, sure. Um, so I have, oh my goodness, I think it's been, it's been like over 10 years. I actually started my life working in politics, where working on the Obama campaigns, I was doing a bit on the Latino vote team, where working with data at scale, uh, I needed something awesome and powerful to use. And that's when I started stumbling into Python and found Chicago Python user group. So my work actually stems not from a more traditional background, like let's say computer science, but actually more through the kind of applied mathematical um, space. Awesome. Yeah, we see a lot of folks coming from that non-traditional route and definitely great to see them in the industry. Yeah. So you are very involved in the Python Software Foundation. We did talk a little bit before about the uh, the elections of the board of directors ending today. Can you tell us what the Python Software Foundation is? Sure, sure, sure. So broadly speaking, so there is kind of two, there's a little bit of a myth I think that some folks have with the Python Software Foundation that we are the core developers who create the language. We can be the folks who create the core language, but the Python Software Foundation itself is an entity that exists to kind of take care of the things that power Python, like PyPI. Uh, we also have in our mission statement that we are very dedicated to building a diverse and inclusive space that reflects the global awesomeness of the Python community. So there's specific ways that we do that, uh, for example, with the grants program, which is really awesome. So if you're like having a Python sprint or you're doing a Python user group and you're looking for a little bit of financial support, that's something that we take care of. Um, and so I sit on the board of directors. So we think a lot about how do we help the open source community be awesome and continue to be awesome. Awesome. And uh, if people want to find out more information about the PSF, uh, do you have a resource they can go to? Yeah, definitely. So if you actually go to python.org, you'll be able to see it. there's on the top nav bar, you'll see PSF. If you click on PSF, there's information about the Python Software Foundation there, including how you can register as a member. And I will, you know, actually, if you want, you could pop open maybe python.org forward slash PSF forward slash membership. I'll put a link in uh, the slides at the end when I tweet out my content with a link of where you can register as a member, since I know spewing words at you is not going to be very easy. But um, Python.org, if you just click PSF, there's information about how to be a member, there's information about what we do, there's information about the board of directors and more good things. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I will, uh, I'll go out and I'll find that link and put it in the chat yeah. as well. Perfect. And uh, so a lot, of our, a lot of our members are dealing with being isolated and dealing with uh, just being uh, like quarantined mm -hmm. during this period. How have you dealt with... Uh, with these feelings? <laughs> so I think like many of us, we're trying to replicate a little bit of the goodness in the world that we normally would go to. So I will say I, I probably have really leaned into finding really cool actual open source things I can contribute to. Uh, one, one space that I really like in Chicago, so beyond just the awesome Chicago Python user group space, which is really great and has a great Slack, you should definitely go check that out. Um, I do a lot with PyLadies, so I've been participating a lot with that, as well as also Shy Hack Night, which is a group I just really love that's based here in Chicago and has a really, cool. Uh, they're, they're set up just like Chippy is set up to do virtual events, they are set up in the they have a fixed event every Tuesday. So for me, it's kind of about finding things I can stick in my calendar to maintain a little bit of having some kind of productivity, right? Something that I both find valuable and relates to my interests. So finding those kind of opportunities has been really great. And I'll say this, 
I am very here for like all the Netflix parties and with <laughs> actually friends of mine, what we do is we do like a synced countdown. We have like a discord server going and we like pick all kinds of films. We've done Star Trek Mondays. We have a lot of really great Bollywood films. Uh, there's a lot of really fun kind of ways you can build things into your calendar while still being safe and quarantining at home. So I would definitely encourage people, uh, you know, if you, if you have more ideas, pop them into the YouTube channel share what your best things are. I, I'm always really impressed with what people come up with. Awesome. And uh, I believe yesterday was Captain Picard Day. So happy belated Captain Picard Day. <laughs> I am a huge Trekkie. So I do very much appreciate that. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I don't know why, but it's in my calendar and it always goes up every year. <laughs> but, that, but that's enough about Star Trek. Are you Are you ready to go with your talk? I'm all good. Thanks so much. All right, let me get your screen added. Lorena, please take it away. Fantastic. Okay. So I'm a huge, I am a huge believer in having slides available to click to all the things. So if you are interested in, in following along or you want to reference some of this content after the fact, uh, you will find the slides at bit.ly for forward slash DL dash telenovela. So deep learning dash telenovela. Pretty, pretty intuitive. But let's go ahead and get into it. Es Cuenca la Babosa, a Python deep learning telenovela. Before we do get into the core of the, today's chat, I did actually want to make a subtle call out um, or maybe a, an intentional call out. Specifically us as technologists, it is our duty to stay informed. This means educating ourselves on bias in tech as well as how tech impacts and amplifies issues of equity. The decisions we make in how we build and use tech can have a real negative or positive impact. One thing I've done to kind of think about this is I've started a reading list that covers some of these topics and I would be very open to your suggestions or feedback. In the link for the slides, you can actually go and check out a GitHub repository that I have started crowdsourcing, um, which maps to the website bias in period tech. But more so than that, you know, ed educating ourselves is good, but we can't stop there. It's not enough. We must engage and we must continue the work. So I would encourage you all to to look at places around you. Maybe you're not in Chicago and you wanna be involved. There's definitely other places to look, but here's some resources that do have a little bit more of a focus on the Chicagoland area. First, Black Lives Matter, talking about the What Matters 2020 campaign, which has a very detailed kind of set of agenda items that I think are very good to review and are very actionable for people to participate in. The Chicago Alliance Against Racial, against racial and Political repression, talks about some of the hyper-local issues here in Chicago. And then uh, actually I have kickstarted a bias in tech channel on the Chicago Python user group Slack, which I think would be a great place for us to continue to talk about these themes. And then lastly, the Algorithmic Justice League is a really, really cool uh, group that is doing some very important work about understanding bias and equity in tech. And I actually will give them a little bit of a head nod. So all that to say, I encourage you all to stay engaged in the conversation and continue to show up to do the work. And we all learn better by being invested in this together. So I, I hope that you all take advantage of some of these resources. So now getting a little bit into the talk. So you heard a little bit about my introduction, but just suffice it to say that my background, um, how I kind of got into being an engineer that I am today, which uh, I work as a data engineer at GitHub, I come from this background of political science. So having more kind of like the toy problems that helped me do the work that I was very passionate about be it when I was working on a presidential campaign or in grad school for research that I was doing, I always kind of had, had a little bit of a, I wanna to try to do that thing. And yet you're gonna see that theme pop up in today's talk. So yes, again, my name is Lorena Mesa and I am here because I am really interested in deep learning and wanted to start so thinking about how I could understand deep learning more, because actually in my day job at GitHub, uh, deep learning is a huge part of the of what our machine learning teams work with. And that is actually an area that I do not have as much expertise in. So I'm thinking about a way that I can learn about deep learning. And then also realizing that I really love telenovelas. I was like, let's see if I can marry these two topics together and come up with a talk. Win-win, right? <laughs> I think so. Uh, by by uh, by the way, I did mention I'll be tweeting things out. If you do want to stay in touch, that is my Twitter handle. And yes, that is Lorena with four O's in a row and then a fifth one at the end. But I'll have all the slides there posted. 
So let's go ahead and, and then actually talk a little bit about what is what is deep learning and better yet, where have we seen it in the world around us? So it's one, one place that we may have seen it has is in these real time, oop, looks like that bounced, let me get that back, is in real time behavior analysis systems. So let's just take a moment for this. So as you can see, the, what this video is demonstrating is, te is a technology called Deep Glint, which uses deep learning to derive insights on the beha on behaviors from people, uh, on objects like people, on objects like cars. Um, as you can see in this first clip here, what the system is, is providing insight is not only just observing what's happening in the bank, but also understanding the movement of the individuals. So you'll notice that it's got an orientation axis showing which ways folks are engaging, which ways they're moving. Um, and coming up in just a few seconds, then we'll see an example of deep glint and how it does real-time analysis of traffic. So let's, yes, so this next sequence here, we see that it's capturing some stats on motorists, both in cars and motorcycles. So this is one example of implementation of deep learning in the wild. Um, another place that we may have seen, uh, that we may have seen deep learning is this topic called deep fakes. So I'm gonna actually pause here and play just a few seconds. It's not, the audio is not as important as much as it is that I, I'll, I'll be making some call outs. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to give this a go and see if that works well. So let's go ahead and check this out. Meet Jennifer Lore Semi, a deep fake mashup of actor Steve Buscemi and actress Jennifer Lawrence. This deep fake video portrait uses Buscemi's face on Lawrence's body, along with her facial expressions. I've never looked better. Also, scarily realistic deep video portraits like this could take fake news to the next level. So I think that's also a really highly topical thing. Deep fakes, fake news, all things that are really being ripped from the headlines. So this YouTube series, uh, Digital Trends, what they were talking about is specifically in 2019, that that mashup with Steve Buscemi and Jennifer Lawrence was just an example of like what deep fakes are. So while Buscemi, jokes to, uh, well, he jokes on late night television that I have never looked better. Um, what deep fakes are, are just one of the latest ways that uh, that today's society is being challenged by the increasing rate at which technology can invade our privacy or even warp our perception of what is truth in the world around us. Another highly topical and top of funnel uh, example of where we may see deep learning, it has been quite, again, quite literally ripped from the headlines in talking about facial recognition software. So moving left to right, what, what these are all kind of capturing, what we see on the left-hand side here is ripped from 2018, talking about the, M, um, the Amazon tech product recognition, which in 2018, the ACLU explicitly was calling out this piece of tech when it found that this, uh, that the, that the Amazon product falsely identified 25 members of Congress as, pe as people who have been arrested for crimes. Additionally, the ACLU found that this software um, was using uh, basically a, a, a data set, which is mugshots, about 25,000 images in a mugshot photo, where we have disproportionately um, imbalanced data where we have more representation of BIPOC, that is Black, Indigenous, People of Color faces. And also, there has been a lot of question about just the, about about the, the quality of mugshots themselves, you know, the way that different faces are captured, is the lighting good, is the lighting poor, all of these things are being used and then fed with deep learning to help actually do facial recognition. So while while there's there's even some questions about how deep learning is used in, in that software, um, what got more problematic is then when it's being used in law enforcement. So as we've seen over the last week or two, we've seen big tech stepping up and saying that they will not be participating um, in selling facial, recon fake facial recognition software to law enforcement agencies with uh, some saying, nope, we're just not gonna do it with others like Amazon saying, you know what, we're gonna hold off for you for a year and wait to see if there's gonna be some legislation that steps up to help us understand that. And as I mentioned, the Algorithmic Justice League as a, as a potential resource to learn more about this, um, founder, uh, the Algorithmic Justice League founder, Joy, actually is someone whose research really began exploring the limitations of what facial recognition tech can do 
particularly in identifying BIPOC faces. Her work was actually quite seminal in helping lead the discussion about the use of facial recognition technology. And if you're interested in learning about more of her work, she's prominently featured in a new documentary called Coded Bias, which is a part of the human rights campaign uh, uh, film fest, which is available to view online. So deep learning, you know, we, we can use it for real time traffic analysis, we can use it for we can use it for uh, surveillance technology, such as facial recognition. However, we have other applications of deep of deep learning in the world around us, for example, doing translation in real time, as you can see in the images here, um, in using Google Translate, um, my mobile phone, you're actually able to translate images uh, from multiple languages. So in my example, what I was looking at was looking at my slide deck. What you see is that I've actually said I, the language is in English and I wanna translate it into Portuguese. And the way that this is working under the hood is that there's a neural network that's used to read the image with an optical character recognition, um, an area of research and computer vision, which basically takes the text, translates it into characters, translates it, and then translates it back, superimposing it back into an image on top with the translation. So as you can see from these two examples, this is a little bit of a sensitive kind of implementation. So kind of like how you're like how you hold the image. If let's say you're taking a, like let's say you're you're translating something that's on a piece of paper. If you're holding it a little bit of a different way, how that OCR that optical character recognition maps maybe uh, maybe better, maybe worse. But this is yet another example of deep learning in the wild. And so continuing down this path, moving from computer vision of actually working on faces as an example, or generating fake faces, to now actually starting to look at text and text data. Um, another, another way that we may see deep learning in the world around us has been in the problem space of text generation. So ripped again from, from social media itself, because social media is rife with very interesting conversations about tech and what tech can and cannot do. Uh, we have this example here from uh, March 2018, where there's a user on Twitter proclaiming, I forced a bot to watch a thousand plus hours of the Saw movie and then made it write its own script. Here's the first page. This, this idea of being able to use deep learning to creatively produce text, that is creatively create, uh, creatively create a script, is something that is is highly suspect by some folks. Um, particularly, some folks were skeptical about the text generated from this alleged bot that had to watch a thousand plus hours of saw because there was words like Trump or whale that appeared in its script. And in fact, uh, as far as I can understand, <laughs> I uh, the word Trump uh, nor the word whale actually appear at all in the saw series. Um, I'm not sure if it was just the first saw or like all of the Saw films. Um, and I will say I did not fact check that because personally, I don't feel like watching all the Saw movies for a thousand plus hours to see if those things pop up. It seems like a very strange combination. But the skepticism about how you can, how you actually do text generation with deep learning it, and in the idea of trying to do something creative, like not just doing check text generation, such as predict what word someone's going to enter into a search engine, but trying to do something in the more kind of creative realm, such as pr producing a script, there's a lot, there's a lot of questions about to the about how possible that that can or cannot exist uh, uh, with deep learning instrumentation. Um, a, a rather interesting example that I uh, came across was actually not the not the saw did the whale did the whale not do it debate, which, um, as you see on this previous slide, uh, was actually a meme that people were using trying to call out that, you know, it was interesting how this word whale materialized in the script. Um, but it actually was, uh, other folks are thinking about how to do creative computation with deep learning to, to create um, things that we that we presume that only humans can, can, can do, such as create art, create films, all of these things. Um, one example of someone thinking about this uh, is an individual by the name of Ross Goodwin, who in 2017 created this short, which Ars Technica captured, alleging that it was perhaps the first work that actually used deep learning to actually create and generate a short film script. Uh, I am not gonna play that film for you. It is quite intriguing. Uh, it's a little bit of a short. I would encourage you to go check it out. Again, this does link to that short. Um, if you do wanna watch it, yes, it does involve David Hasselhoff, but there are other people trying to think about the about how can we stretch the applications of what deep learning can and cannot do. And here's just put one example where yes, we do get a short with David Hasselhoff. <laughs>
So re returning to the idea of, you know, where is deep learning around us? How is it being applied? It's being it's being applied in, in a lot of interesting ways that we may not understand or at face value think it's possible. So in thinking about, you know, what's a toy project that I could I could try out, I thought, okay, well, let, let's go ahead and do some, let's try again this idea of text generation. But, you know, instead of making a short with uh, David Hasselhoff or doing something inspired by the saw, because I'm not a huge fan of horror movies, I thought, well, what would it look like if we were to use deep learning to try to create a telenovela? But in order to even do that, I think it probably is important for us to actually talk about what a telenovela is. So to help us think about what deep learning can do, can it create a can it create a telenovela? Let me pause and give you a little a little crash course on telenovelas. So I'm going to start with perhaps an explanation of one of the most absurd things I've ever seen in film, let alone perhaps on television, and that is the legendary Esquinca la babosa, which is lovingly featured in the title of this talk. Uh, Esquinca la babosa, roughly translated, means you spoiled spoiled, stupid, entitled brat. Emphasis on the idea that we have a child that is somehow entitled and that is supposed to be a term shaming that child. Uh, so the legendary Squinka La Babosa scene comes to, comes to us from a telenovela named Maria La del Barrio. And perhaps this scene is one of the most memeable scenes scenes of all telenovelas. Um, it's quite easy, like if you type in a scandalo, like in Giphy, like, or scandalous or anything like that, you're likely gonna find something from this scene. So here's the here's the condensed story of what happens in this scene. So what we have, um, we have Soraya Montenegro, who is the, the individual in the bottom left hand screaming as Cuenca La Babosa. So we have Soraya Montenegro, who's the main protagonist of this iconic 1990s Mexican telenovela. Let's just say that Soraya's character, well, she's not exactly the best person. Um, here's her story. Soraya's having a party when Nandito, her ex-lover's son, sn sneaks into her current stepdaughter's Alicia's room and tells her that he loves her. So that's the two, the two young faces at the top on the left-hand side. Nandito asks to kiss Alicia after professing his love to her. And Soraya, who's still deeply in love with her ex on a way that could be, on a level that could be described as um, obsessive, she happens to walk into the room right when the, the kiss is about to happen. And she stares at Alicia and she screams, Esquinca la babosa. The next few minutes that ensue are a huge mess. And what we observe can best be described as a very dramatic fight. <laughs> So Raya basically fights everyone. She fights the nanny. She fights a random person that shows up in a full suit. She fights everyone. So this is this is this kind of example of a scene is a very kind of this is very telenovela. It is like it it has all the drama. And to give you a little bit of a taste of this, and again the audio is not so important as much as it is that I would like you to get a little bit of a of a hint of the, for the feel of what a telenovela is. Um, here's that infamous scene broken down. <laughs> So she's now yelling at Alicia. <laughs> so there's the nanny. Soraya is not having it. She's blaming Alicia for everything. Because again, she's in love with her ex. Um, she's in love with her ex, and her ex is uh, the father of Nandito, so she thinks that this like strange love triangle happens. Somehow Soraya's chance to get back with her ex are going to be thrown out the window. But she's also still married, so there's a lot here to, to unfold. But this is kind of considered a very, very stereotypical representation of the canon of telenovelas. So... Oh, my bad. Let me go back. Um, so when we when we talk about telenovelas, uh, something very important to understand um, about telenovelas is is this kind of over the top nature of them. Um, Jorge uh, Gonzalez, a genetic epistemia 
epistemologist, that is one who studies the development of knowledge um, at UNAM, the National Autonomous University of Mexico, he fundamentally describes telenovelas as a social phenomena of televised melodramas um, that are based on the construction of a relationship of fidelity with the audience. Or put another way, telenovelas are a series of stories that create this relationship of, fide of fidelity, or that is intense loyalty with the audience, such that we want to watch the telenovelas. We must watch the telenovelas. We are compelled to watch the telenovelas. So that kind of um, obsessive, that obsessive relationship that the audience has with the telenovela is a very, very um, cornerstone kind of piece of the telenovela experience. You know, telenovelas are quite popular around the world. Some quick stats on Latin American telenovelas. Latin American telenovelas have been have been watched in more than 100 countries. Um, about $800 million a year is used in creating telenovelas. And with Mexico alone, they produce about 3,000 hours of telenovelas each year, which costs about 250 million US dollars, which by the way, is more or less the cost of the budget for the Hollywood film Titanic. So needless to say, telenovelas are one of the fastest growing genres in the world today with approximately 2 billion people watching them or you know, somewhere around like one third of the global population. So knowing that telenovelas are serial, serialized short dramas that are uniquely defined by their almost obsessive like love with, that the audience has for them, what we need to do to, to, to start understanding how we can do a deep learning implementation is not only understand what a telenovela is, but understand the arc of a telenovela. What do telenovela narratives look like? In a 2012 PBS NewsHour report focusing on the impact and power of telenovelas, Dr. Uh, Diana Rios of the University of Connecticut emphasized that there is, uh, emphasized the cult, emphasized the importance of cultural and familial bonds with telenovelas that are held by the viewers. Um, as Dr. Rios says, things have to be cleaned up by things have to be cleaned up so the audience has satisfaction. They don't want to worry about Maria. Did she find true love? Did she find her true mother or her true father? Dr. Rio observes. Um, so what Dr. Gonzalez actually breaks down for us in thinking about the social phenomena of what makes this intense relationship between the viewer and the telenovela, she describes that there's three processes that are happening. One, we have a symbolic, uh, we are building a symbolic uh, commonality between the social agent and the culture. Two, we're creating a believable set of worlds. And three, we're enacting a symbolic struggle that defines basic human cultural elements in these worlds. So again, really emphasizing on making sure that these believable worlds are possible, we have to think about how do we take everyday kind of struggles that individuals may have and kind of blow them up a bit. As um, an example of where we may see this in other medium in um, the Latin American tradition, um, more so maybe the, the Mexican tradition is in what we call um, corridos, um, which are a uh, kind of like a format of storytelling and the format of storytelling through song. So with telenovelas, when we think about how they have to struggle to prolong the inevitable conclusion, pulling at our heartstrings so that we continue to faithfully watch them through the end, how else can we see this in, in, in um, Latin American storytelling? Well, Corritos, as I mentioned, is kind of an example of this in a very small format in a song. Um, there's a famous song that is uh, called um, La Fama de la Pareja by Los Tigres del Norte. And this, this Corrito is basically telling the story of the couple Rosa and Luis. The couple traffic something very dangerous, which we are never explicitly told what it is, from Jalisco to, to San Diego. And the fate and their fate about what happens to Rosa is dramatically sung out through this song, with the culmination of the song telling us that the couple were successful in having crossed the border back to Jalisco with muchos millones, or that is many millions of dollars and sus negocios prosperan, or their businesses thrive. So this idea of kind of this canon of having these like very extreme over the top, um, like uh, uh, dramatic kind of moments embedded into storytelling is something that makes storytelling quite unique if we think about the, the legacy and the impact of what a telenovela is. We see it not only in telenovelas, but we also see it in through the expression of music. So the arc of a telenovela, if we're, if we're kind of, globbing some sense together and thinking about what does it mean to authentically create a telenovela arc. Um, let's, let's 
let's go back to some of the things that Dr. Um, Dr. Rios provided us. We need to have a social world that is cemented on the experience of the viewer. It needs to be believable and we need to have a series of struggles that happen. Again, we want that emotional turmoil. So then thinking about how we translate this back into a plot that we want our deep learning model to create, we have to think about a fixed melodramatic plot that is love lost, mothers and daughters fighting, long lost relatives, love found. Um, we need a fixed arc with an actual tangible end and we need a conclusion that ties up the loose ends ideally with some kind of happy element, such as a big wedding or, you know, becoming millionaires and having thriving businesses as we saw in the Corrido example before. So now that we've kind of diagnosed a little bit of what a telenovela is and what the arc of a telenovela ought to look like, let's actually take a look at some telenovelas. So some examples of some famous telenovelas in, in Espanol or in Spanish are these three here. Uh, from left to right, La Reina del Sur, Yo Soy Betty La Fea, and Juana La Virgin. Um, so uh, perhaps one of my most favorite La Reina del Sur is based uh, in, in Mexico, um, well, starts in Mexico, I should say, and is in 2011 and is actually starring um, Kate del Castillo as Teresa La Mexicana Mendoza. At 10 million US dollars, this is the second most expensive telenovela produced in, in uh, produced by Telemundo. And I'm happy to say that it is pretty awesome. You can watch it on Netflix. So we have that, we have an example of this one. Um, the Yo Soy Betty La Fea is, is another example of a very prominent telenovela. This is a tragic comedy. And this is actually the first telenovela to have been made, to have been made, uh, remade worldwide, including in such countries as Belgium, India, and Turkey. And then another really famous uh, example of a telenovela, Juana la Virgin, is from a 2002 series in Venezuela. So while these are three really, really immensely popular telenovelas, for the sake of this talk, it's probably going to be a little bit e easier to generate something in English. So in doing that, let's look at the English, at the English crossovers. So we've got Queen of the South, we've got Ugly Betty, and we've got Jane the Virgin. Um, so the Three here, if we're looking at kind of their categories, uh, Queen of the South is a drama. It's a thriller. It's about long lost love. Um, basically, it summarizes the rise of Teresa, the prominent character, where she flees from Mexico and resettles in South Spain, becoming the most successful drug trafficker in the area. And also, she's successful in getting revenge on the narcos who killed her boyfriend. Um, Ugly Betty is probably something that we're quite familiar with. Uh, again, tragic comedy, comedy, and the whole story is fixed around um, Betty, who is you know, basically wins everyone over with her brilliance and her charms. And it's a story about really Betty becoming um, coming one in her own and, and realizing she's awesome, even as she tries to compare herself to all the impossibly beautiful people in the fashion industry around her. And then Jane the Virgin is a rom-com and comedy. And uh, it, it has Gina, Ro Gina Rodriguez starring as Jane, where uh, a very religious young Latina who is a waitress in Miami somehow gets in some, artificially inseminated when she goes to her OBGYN and ends up getting pregnant. And so it tells the impossibly wild story of what happens to her after this wild pregnancy happens. So again, notice these three have very distinct, they have strong women leads, they have very distinct uh, kind of wild and over the top um, experiences while motherhood is something that we experience, that people experience or while, uh, while loss of love is something we experience, it doesn't necessarily happen like this. <laughs> So now that we've explored what a, what a telenovela is and we've defined the arc of a telenovela and we found some quintessential examples of telenovelas, let's, let's talk a little bit about how we can use deep learning to do text generation. So um, the language of machine learning, uh, if you think about how we've kind of seen in the earlier talk or even um, borrowing from a 1950s language, when we talk about machine learning, we say uh, the, initial con the initial construct introduced to us is we say that a computer can learn without being explicitly programmed. Um, Tom Mitchell, a professor of machine learning at Carnegie Mellon expanded upon this definition by saying, well, it's not, you know, it's not just that we aren't explicitly programming it, but we can set up these programs to think about providing some experience, for in, um, some some understanding of what is the task that that program ought to accomplish. And then based on how well that computer program performs that task, we'll have a performance measurement. So we're able to say that a program, a computer program is learning based on iteratively, ideally getting better at this task 
through some performance measurement. So while well, machine learning kind of follows that idea of having a task and experience and some kind of training to accomplish uh, an output that we're trying to optimize and, and get better at doing, um, there's a lot in machine learning that, that uh, we could talk about. So when we talk about deep learning, um, deep learning kind of sits in the bubble of an area of research, not necessarily around tools and tech, um, but, but more so an area of research. And this movement from artificial intelligence to deep learning has continued to build upon the idea of what does it mean to achieve learning and by what mechanism do we obtain it? With machine learning, that example of providing some ground truth, some example of how to do the task in the wild, we, when we have some idea of what the output should be, when we provide it some ground truth, that is what's employed in supervised learning. When we have unsupervised learning kind of implementations, we may not know what the output is, so we have to allow the algorithm to kind of infer and create categories for us. So clustering might be an example of that. For example, news clusters, if you've ever been on, the, on a news feed, and in a given day, we may not know all the news topics that are, that are emerging. So if we have, let's say, a unsupervised implementation figuring out what are the clusters of, of news topics on a given day, they might be using an unsupervised approach. And then lastly, when it comes now into deep learning, when we start, when we start moving away from um, what, what becomes new in this space is now we start talking about the agent of learning itself. We add in a neural network, the, the thing that actually drives and powers the learning. So an example of like what, what deep learning looks like if we were to kind of provide a toy example, um, let's say we have a programmable flashlight and the programmable flashlight can respond to vocal cues. The programmable flashlight maybe will hear me say like the word dark. And given th that it understands the word dark, it's like, aha, uh -huh, I heard the word dark, so I should, I should turn on. A deep learning implementation would not only just be able to respond to the word dark, but it would actually be able to infer meaning from other phrases. So for example, if I said, ah, I can't see, or the light switch won't work, a deep learning implementation would actually be able to start understanding relationships between dark and like what other phrases may be similar to express darkness where it can then turn on and illuminate and make our life a little bit easier. So the way that a deep learning model learns how to do this is through a computation method uh, that we may call an activation function, we may call its brain, or can be better represented by a neural, uh, by, a <clears throat> by a neutron. So with, with uh, this kind of graphic here, if you're thinking about our example of the programmable flashlight, maybe initially like the input that is provided if what the program is listening to is just my words, it may say, okay, I understand the word dark, but now I'm gonna start understanding the word dark in relation to other words that you use. When when we have a when we have a neural network um, starting to kind of think about input and how it infers meaning, for example, if we're looking at words, what we can say is that it's not only understanding the individual word itself, but it's understanding the word in relation to other things. So in this graphic here, for example, if I were talking about milk, some other phrases that may be used to describe milk may include that it's a liquid, that it can be drunk, that it's drunk out of a glass, or that it is white in appearance. Um, what, our, what our deep learning implementation is able to do is to derive new insights from the input provided, let's say words, assign meaning to those words, and then understand how in relation to that input and to other input that it had previously, previously seen, it can start to try to understand how, um, it, it can start understanding new insights about how language works together. So the, the, the foundation of our learning agent then is gonna be the neuron, which, which is based on kind of like how the human brain works. And so in thinking about, and so in thinking about the human, um, and about the human brain, you know, we're not working with organic matter, but the architecture of a neuron is, is, is simply kind of represented like this. We have inputs. So for our example, we're talking about words. Um, those inputs then represent, basically are some feature set that we represent as a weighted number. We then have weights, which is that uh, some numeric value that indicates the strength of that feature. And then we pass them through um, a activation function, which is some nonlinear function, which adjusts the weighted sum of the inputs to basically say, <clears throat> how um, as it's trying to understand and process and, 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 uh, and perform its task, it's going to be adjusting the rate at which we're learning that is, adjusting the weights we provide to the input to actually start modeling a um, <clears throat> to actually start modeling a linear combination of 
weights and inputs with some nonlinear function to actually understand and optimize <clears throat> what is the best optimal weight for our feature set to help us get to the ideal output. Part of how we do that is by training a neuron, which is basically just the process of iter iteratively updating the weights associated with the feature input vector by using a nonlinear activation function. The more that activation function mutates the, the, the input vector that is changing the weights associated with our inputs, we say we are learning at a higher rate. Effectively, all the training process does is it approximates the underlying relationship to the data set until we find an optimal set of weights in order to do the task at hand. So for example, maybe turning on that flashlight. So at the start of this talk, I kind of threw out there this idea of deep fakes and what deep fakes do. Deep fakes are not only just the mashing of faces, but actually trying to generate speech that go along with that, some kind of believable uh, language that would be the mashup of Jennifer Lawrence and Steve Buscemi, or in more scary examples, trying to approximate language for famous folks such as politicians. That, that's kind of an example of what deep learning can do for text generation. There's actually a tool here that exists uh, uh, that's powered by the GP2 algorithm, which in this example, which is a, just a screenshot showing how the GP2 algorithm um, created by OpenAI works, is as I start typing something, so notice I threw in just this one line of text, Lorena said at her computer typing, scratching her head, thinking of what to write. What this is actually able to do with deep learning is then do the subsequent uh, text generation where I've got the balance of that at the bottom where it then starts generating a narrative for me. And what's kind of wild here is it's just using, <clears throat> it's just using, uh, this, this implementation is just using words and the features of the words and the characters themselves to help start approximating and thinking of likely text to generate on the other side. So when we think about deep learning and specifically text generation as an example of deep learning, um, this is this is just basically sequence processing. So sequencing sequence processing has applications in several areas such as video processing, price modeling, and yes, text generation. There's two generate um, there's two approaches then we have to actually doing text generation. We can feed in words or we can feed in characters to generate text. So to answer the question, how do we create something that sounds telenovela-ish? Well let's actually use the scripts from the telenovelas themselves. And luckily we've already gone through understanding what would be good candidates for us to look at because we spent some time trying to understand what telenovelas are. And so looking at these three, then we're able to go and pull the, those scripts down and use the words themselves to try to see if we can do some text generation to maybe yes or no, generate a deep learning script. <clears throat> So the architecture of neural networks can differ in many factors, the number of nodes used, how many neurons are connected, the movement of information, et cetera. For, the, for, all, for brevity for this talk, we've selected an RNN, specifically a long short-term memory RNN recurring neural network as recurrent models are good, have, have generally speaking performed well with text generation. Um, particularly generating, te um, generating uh, text in sequence. And additionally, what's cool about using an RNN is that we're able to not only put in input and move the input of, we're not only able to put input in and have that information flow from just one node out to the output and then generate a, let's say a character or a word it predicts, but we're actually able to, through different architectures, move information and insights learned forward and backward propagating to to make better informed uh, guesses about what character or, or what word we wanna feed out on the other side. So using several layers, using several layer, using several layers of neural networks, we're then able um, more than just the base three, which is our input, our hidden layer, which is doing that kind of activation function, adjusting the weights, and then the output, we're actually able to choose from different architectural um, implementations to then say we've now got a deep a set of deep neural networks. So in making an RNN in Python, there's a few ways we can do it. We've got quite a quite a good set of tools. We've got tools like Keras, tools like TensorFlow, and tools like PyTorch available. In fact, if you want to know a little bit more about why Python's so good uh, in, in working in this space, I always suggest people check out Jake Founderplass's 2017 keynote. But in 
thinking about how I kickstart things off, I always kind of start with these three framing questions. Um, what, how much technical expertise is required to get started? What are, are your requirements? For example, how, how fast does it need to work? What's the size of your data set? And then also how easy is it to work with the framework? So in thinking about each of these questions, um, in thinking about me, I would say I'm a beginner with deep learning. I want something that can work on a small on a small toy project. And I'm ideally looking for something with robust kind of community support and demos. Um, additionally, when it comes to requirements, really the only requirements, because I am hyper-focusing on, on three telenovelas, I'm working with approximately less than 100 megabytes of data. That is only four seasons of, of Queen of the South, four seasons of Ugly Betty and five seasons of Jane the Virgin. So we're gonna be working with text data. Additionally, having something that has some intuitive debugging is always ideal. And then leading into the ease of the framework that we can use, um, again, sensical debugging, something that can bootstrap easily and something that doesn't require a lot of deep mathematical knowledge to get started. All of that then informs me to kind of say, well, what, what works with my, with my requirements alongside what, what's available in these libraries? And as you can see, uh, what kind of become ideal candidates for me look at Keras and TensorFlow specifically. What's cool about TensorFlow is it has Keras baked into it. It's got, it's got both a high and low level API and we can make use of eager execution. <clears throat> and so in thinking about debugging, why eager execution is pretty good is that when you're debugging, you're actually able to debug in the order in which you write your program and iterate. Unlike static execution where your program builds a structure for your neural network in advance, optimizing to make um, optimizing it to so that uh, your so that you are using a little bit yes uh, less GPU, making it a little bit easier on your machine that you're working with. Uh, if you can debug in sequence as you're learning, it's just a little bit more intuitive, I find. So TensorFlow has that that add-on value. So in making an RNN in Python, if we were looking at kind of like the the, the steps that we need to consider. We would, um, there's kind of three things we need to under, uh, that we need to do. Step one, we need to transform text data into input sequences. Remember, we're gonna either be using words or characters. So depending on the way we tokenize the text, that is splitting the body of text into smaller pieces, um, it will be guided by if you use the word or the character. And then once we have those tokenized, um, what we will need to do then is rescale our data into values of zero or one. Um, the way that we do that, well, step two is we're gonna generate um, we're going to generate character hot encodings. So for words, we tokenize each word into one hot vector. For characters, we tokenize each letter um, into a one hot vector. Um, basically, hot encodings allow the model to predict the probability of each character in the vocabulary. And on the next slide, we'll kind of have a, an example of what that looks like. So step one, we have to transform our text data into uh, we have to tokenize it and then we have to rescale it from zero to one to make these vector encodings. And then once we have these vector encodings, what we need to do is we need to provide it as input for our model and then train it over some N training epochs so that we can then start using it to predict and generate text. And thinking about character encoding, um, if we were looking at, um, again, character not word encoding, let's say we had a corpus where we had the uh, input set of A, B, C, D, E, E, F, G, H, I. So the length of our corpus would be nine. So what we would need to do is for each um, for each character, let's say we have the word bad, what we would what we'd want to do is then uh, we would want to then encode in that corpus zero is it the target means false, one means yes. We have to generate a vector for each character relative to the length of the corpus of the number of characters of all the unique characters in that corpus to then be able to scale our data from words into that zero to one representation, which we can feed in to our algorithm. So with um, with using Keras, as you can see, what's um, what's pretty great is that we've got <clears throat> uh, we've got our sequential model as as I. Or as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is a, a sequential uh, processing problem. So we're able to pull that out directly. We add in the LSTM and then we are, <clears throat> so when we select our model, we use sequential, we provide the input data, again, our hot vector encoded data to the model. And then we fit the model with some number of epochs. And here we can take our text data and translate it from text into the one hot character vector. So in between when you're doing that model fit, if you were working with, uh, if you're working with your text data, you would have to do some kind of manipulation to to translate it into the uh, into the one hot vector uh, data set. And then um, in going then to an, an example of what that may look like in TensorFlow, 
Um, additionally, again, what, what we have is we're, we're going to just be pulling in and <clears throat> what we're going to be pulling in. And uh, you'll notice here that Tensor 2.0 Plus allows you to use the Keras API, which we previously saw a little bit of a snippet of. So here we can pull in the sequential Keras model. We can add the LSTM layer and we can add in the dense layer. And then again, we can use um, we can use metrics like the Atom the, like the Atom optimizer to help us understand how we are doing in 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 doing text generation to help us in solving the problem of can we generate text that sounds telenovela ish. So needless to say, regardless of if you're using Keras or if you're using TensorFlow, there's always uh, there's always going to be a fit where we're training. Uh, where we will be training our model over some n epochs again, adjusting those weights associated with our input, um, our input vectors to find some optimized, some optimal weight to where those optimal weights help us generate words or characters rather that would appear in texts that are labeled as telenovela text. So that again, our input data is derived from the one uh, derived from the character sets provided from our telenovela scripts. We train it from for some period of time to get the to get the ideal weights. And then we can go and actually try using it in the wild. <clears throat> so if you are using the lower level API, you are able to use things like the um, like using sessions and a coordinator to help you with training. But for for all intents and purposes, what's what's good about TensorFlow is you both have that high level and low level API. <clears throat> and so it, um, there is actually a uh, repository that is that that walks through these examples in each of them, um, showing you as well with with PyTorch how you can do that same setup of providing the input, doing the training, and then starting to actually use your model for, for text generation. So in getting to our culminating um, creating a telenovela script with an RNN, what is possible? Here are some examples of some text generated when doing different epochs and only using a subset of our data sets. So something that, that I think is quite interesting here, and really as far as I've been able to get at this point, is, is just getting a few lines of coherent, of coherent text before it starts getting a bit more murky. <laughs> um, in, in looking at text generated with Jane the Virgin, if we're, if we're using all only Jane the Virgin and, and doing 30 epochs, what we find is we get some text that is saying, is it a milagro, milagro meaning miracle? Was I drinking? No, no, my God, no, I wasn't. What made you ask me? Ask that I am still me. So <laughs> I thought it was interesting that yes, you are starting to get some sequence of text that is talking about um, pregnancy, that is talking about like, how does someone get pregnant? Um, the second when using Ugly Betty only as your corpus that, for the input data that you're trained on, um, the text here, you see themes of like the graphics department. She works in a fashion, in she works in the fashion industry at a magazine um, and talking about being unhappy. So it's kind of interesting. We start seeing those themes pop up. And again, um, Ugly Betty is a tragic comedy. So the idea that like we're even getting words like unhappy and softer side, kind of that duality and starting to see some of that language creep up. Um, and looking at Queen of the South, which is that drama about, a, about um, uh, Teresa Mendoza becoming the, the king of all narco trafficking in South Spain um, and North Africa. The language here we see generated is one that in, immediately begins with threat of violence. Do not threaten me. Do you understand me? Do you understand me? Whoa, whoa, all right. Hey, look. <laughs> so when we start then kind of splicing and combining this data sets together, or in this case, using all, what's interesting is um, Kind of the theme we get on the other side so i'm proof that surprise happened even if you do not believe me why would you i am a woman after all i thought that line was really really wild i am a woman after all because again these are all prominent women leads from our telenovelas that have like really extreme things happen to them once we start kind of combining our data sets we start seeing different themes kind of emerging and hyper being um, elevated to the top so when we think about how we can create a telenovela on par with something like maria uh, La del Barrio. Um, there's a few ways we can think about how we could start gluing some of this together. We could train a long, short-term um, model for just Soraya. We could train one for just Nandito. We could train another model for just the random man who walks in with a suit um, in the fight scene, or we could train one for the maid. So the idea is maybe we could just train models that represent characters that we know we want to have in our telenovela. Or another way we can start thinking about it is perhaps slicing and dicing our data more, more 
uh, with more granularity. So approaches for creating um, telenovela deep learning scripts, some ways that we can move from just having some of these lines of text that, you know, we only get a few lines, but we're not getting a whole corpus of data that is quite coherent on its own. Um, one thing we can think about is rather than just generating one model, we can do a model per character. We can then also then maybe say, let's find similar sources of sources of inspiration for characters. So let's say I knew I wanted to generate a, uh, I wanted to create a telenovela that was exploring the rise of a powerful woman in an industry that's, let's say, traditionally led by men. <laughs> um, so maybe I could look for other telenovelas that talk about the rise of women in industry. So maybe not just focusing on uh, industry like narco trafficking, but maybe like Betty La Fea, like Ugly Betty becomes an example. Or maybe there's another example of a telenovela that I can pull in that can help me provide inspiration for this character model that I'm building. Additionally, the idea then of just creating just creating these models for individual characters, we can also then think about, you know, it's not just that we create an individual character, character, but we're perhaps creating a strong woman lead in a tragic comedy. So the way that we can start kind of weaving these models together, we have to start getting kind of creative in how we we, we have them play off of one another. So generating long term, um, long short term um, models for telenovelas for each type of for each type of melodrama could also be another angle that we take. So maybe we have a model that does some general filler text about long lost love or amnesia or all of the amnesia. There's there's quite a few ways we can think about crafting and building our, our plot together. So needless to say, text generation is, it is hard. <laughs> so creating the learned plot, while it may arguably be possible, I would say without coherent narratives or emotionally compelling characters, we continue to miss the mark. So how can we do better? I, I, I'm gonna say that uh, one of the things that would be really great is getting more data. <laughs> <laughs> so not a unique, not a unique problem here, but in looking at varying data quality, um, I actually myself have been the one transcribing these scripts because there's not really a place you can go and like buy them <laughs> on the internet. Um, so like one way, like in looking at some of these texts, like you'll notice um, that some telenovelas, for example, uh, in uh, in Jane the Virgin, you have like this use of of a narrator, whereas in others you may not. Or if if you are using pre pre-existing data sets, looking at what information you're given versus not. So like the idea of when you read a play script, you're sometimes given stage directions of how people walk in or what's happening in the background. If you are building, if you aren't building your own data set and you're using pre-existing ones, be mindful of what's in there. How are you going to standardize and make them and make them similar across the board? If you are building your own, what are you capturing in them? Is just text enough to help us think about the generation of um, is text data itself enough to help us in creating a plot or creating a script for a telenovela? So in thinking about more ways we can move the needle, I'll just say that the ones that are currently in flight for me, I am working in, on Rosalinda, Muchachitas, Dos Mujeres, Un Camino. And I am actually looking for people who want to like help me build my corpus of data with telenovela scripts. So if that is at all of interest, I do have that actually on GitHub um, where, I'm, where I'm hosting my telenovela scripts. Uh, so that would that's, I think, going to be the first step because <laughs> it does take a while to, to build all these. I actually did have to uh, do a good amount of watching all of those telenovelas for my initial my initial data set. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, one of the things I, I would like to encourage you to, to remember is that even the world's most advanced machine learning platforms are, can be tripped up by such things like a chihuahua versus a, a muffin. <laughs> so we continue to see today that a toddler can be out deep learning and when it figures out what's food and what's Fido. But I would encourage us all to think about how we can continue to bring creative computation into the world with deep learning and see what kind of good projects we can get on the other side. So for continued learnings and things, I've thrown some examples here of articles and blogs you can read and videos and courses you can participate in. And of course, if you're at all of, if you're at all interested in, in me in helping me continue my journey of creating a telenovela, I definitely would love, I would love people to, to help uh, work on this really kind of wacky problem with. And that is gonna be my talk in a nutshell. So I appreciate you all. I know we went a little bit over, but that's, uh, that's kind of where we're at with telenovelas and deep learning. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks so much, Lorena. That was a very, uh, very fun presentation. Had, uh, had a lot of fun. Uh, 
I know um, I know you're not going to be taking questions, but do you have any call to actions for a community? I know you mentioned something at the beginning of your uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, well, one, I would honestly love people to like work on like doing this. Like if you know places where I can get like telenovela scripts, like that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but um, actually, in all seriousness, what um, th th some of the things I think would be really great for us as a community to be mindful of the uh, uh oh. Okay, I'm not sure if you can still hear me, but it looks like my I, I can still hear you. Your your okay. videos frozen, but okay. we can hear you. Um, well, uh, registering on Python.org um, to be a member so that folks can register for for upcoming elections and can participate in a broader Python eco ecosystem would be a great thing to do. And also too, I would love if folks would join us in the uh, in the, the Chippy Slack in talking about bias in tech. I know we've got that channel set up and it would be great to kind of continue that conversation. Yeah, we'll definitely uh, add a link to that at the end of tonight. But thanks so much for your time. This was a, this was a fun presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Well, at least I, it froze just at the end. <laughs> no, it was uh, it was great. Uh, thanks so much, and uh, we'll see you around. Great. Thank you. All right. So that was Lorena Mesa talking about uh, how she's starting to write a telenovela using Python and deep learning. It's crazy how much stuff you can do with machine learning and deep learning. Uh, so that's going to be it for tonight's uh, speakers. I'd like to thank both of them. Uh, the first speaker was Ryan Bales talking about learning from audio data. And thanks again to Lorena Mesa talking about uh, deep learning telenovelas. If you're still here and you're watching this video, go down below and hit that like button. It really helps us out. Also, if you have not subscribed to our channel, hit that subscribe button. We're really trying to get to a thousand subscribers. It's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun. All right, so uh, I have some slides before we close out for the night. Let me get my screen shared. All right, uh, so I want to make everybody aware of where is this? There it goes. All right, so I want to make everybody aware of our upcoming virtual events. So on July second which is a Thursday. We're going to have the algorithm special interest group happening. July 9th is going to be our Dunder main meeting. Uh, July 15th is our next data special interest group event. And then on August 4th, we're going to have our web dev slash DevOps event. Our next data sync is going to be on time series analysis. We have three fantastic speakers. Uh, we have a talk on Facebook profit and uh, InfluxDB, which is a time series database. We have a talk on using Facebook profit in production. And then we have a talk on a new library that is for more modern time series analysis called Stumpy. Uh, we have the creator and core maintainer, Sean Law, gonna be giving an hour long deep dive. Looking forward to that. That's gonna be it for us at Chicago Python. Uh, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.